Yeah, sounds good. We're about live. So, uh, hello, hello, hello. This is Warren Redlick. I'm here with Brian Wong. Brian Wong runs nextbigfuture.com. There should be a link in the description below. If it's not there, I'll put it in there after we're done. Uh, I may have forgotten. I think I put it in there. Brian has a uh, had a career in the corporate world. He has experience as an angel investor, and he has some pretty strong opinions on Tesla stock and the competition. So I want to hear from you, Brian. What's your take on Tesla stock? Where is it now? Where is it going? What do you think about Tesla? So um, I do have, um, you know, conservative cases to to bull cases. Um, my conservative case is that it does get to about um, three trillion to five trillion dollars in um, twenty twenty um, four. So that's mar that's that's market cap, not share price, right? That's a market, pr mar yeah, market cap. That's right. And a, and a three yeah. trillion dollar market cap translates to a three thousand dollar share price. A five trillion dollar market cap translates to roughly a five thousand dollar share price. Correct. Correct. And so, how do you see Tesla getting there? So, um, I see, um, you know, this is a relatively conservative estimate I, that Tesla gets to about six million cars in 2024, 2025. Um, oh, that's a good question. When do you see Tesla getting to $3 trillion to $5 trillion market cap? What year? Yeah, 2024, 2025. That, okay. That time frame. Yeah. And 6 million yeah. cars and what else? So um, I factor in more of the um, uh, autopilot being successful, uh, autopilot FSD being successful, not robotaxi. Um, robotaxi would then increase that by, you know, double or triple. But um, the increasing attachment rate. So Loop Ventures goes over like, you know, only about 25, 30% of um, Tesla buyers Sorry, worldwide Luke are buying. Sorry, Ventures is Pierre Farragou is an analyst who analyzes Tesla stock, right? Um, Luke Ventures. Or is that um, Gene Munster? That's Gene Munster. Gene that's Munster's Gene Munster. company. That's right. But it's an analyst who covers Tesla. An analyst who covers Tesla. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, I have some kind of like intermediate um, things in between um, getting to full robotaxi where Tesla gets more and more profitable because more people buy the autopilot FSD and they raise the prices of it. So if, you know, if they get to, you know, really good um, beta nine release and it has, you know, very good um, driving, maybe not quite robot taxi, but just short of it, that more people will buy it. In particular, more people will buy it in China where the people who buy autopilot FSD are very low. And, but then that, increases the um, the margin that Tesla makes a lot because they're already spending the money on autopilot. If they double the number of people who get it or triple the number of people who get it, um, then that, a lot of that falls to the bottom line and massively increases the price. The other thing that would fall to the bottom line is the insurance, which starts stacking up you know, in, in five years because you're buying the insurance every year. So you can buy $2,000 to $5,000 per for almost every car, and they would have the, um, um, uh, yeah, data-driven insurance pricing. So they would know who, how much to charge everyone, ensure good margins, all that kind of stuff. Um, and also probably even tell people what to do. So those three streams plus the energy stream would Sorry. massively increase. I, I got 6 million cars. I got insurance. What was the second stream? The FSD autopilot, not quite robot taxi, increasing. Okay. The second one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then energy. So the, the fact that you get a lot of hardware insurance sales would increase the margin a lot more. That was um, kind of what Elon Musk was referring to in terms of how their margins would grow a lot more than just a even a really fantastic car maker. So of the four streams, six million cars. FSD and autopilot, insurance and energy. We're leaving out robo taxi. Which of those four do you see being the biggest uh, source of revenue uh, and or profits in 2024, 2025? So I think the um, the car sales would still be um, most of the um, margin because they do somewhat well on the margin, um, especially with the, the batteries and such. And then um, FSD would be would be next. And then insurance would be, but FSD would be starting to get very close. It would be around, say, 30 billion um, 
of um, uh, FSB uh, margin versus 45 billion from the, the cars, even though the overall revenue number would be far smaller. It would be like you know a quarter. It'd be you know almost a triple the 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 FSD revenue to equal how much margin FSD you get has such the, has a really high margin. So even if you don't make as much really revenue on it, you make a lot more profit on it. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And then th- I have also other bull scenarios where basically Tesla wins by you know with the batteries making um, the um, skateboard for all the other companies. If they, you know, like Ford, I think buy the skateboard from Volkswagen right now. If Tesla gets the forty six eighty batteries, then they'll they'll win with that um, by making the the internals, the, the batteries, and the electronics and, and the motors for many other car makers, Toyota or GM, many other companies could end up making that, and that would boost their revenues you know four or five times over over three years or four years um and the other scenario for tesla winning huge that is not often covered um is um see so the robot taxi the um making a, a tesla inside scenario which is what i prefer to getting all the things. and then the, the battery stuff um even on a super pessimistic i know that you don't your battery model that if they, they start making, you know, 500 gigawatt hour batteries, CATL is worth $120 billion right now, the largest battery maker, the, the Chinese battery maker. And they're only making 50, 60 gigawatt hours right now. So if Tesla gets to 10x, then already, already you're like 1 trillion. And um, so that's just an entirely new stream of business just from so from if CATL course, is ma- if CATL is making 60 gigawatt hours of batteries and they're worth 120 billion dollars then if Tesla yeah. makes 600 gigawatt hours of batteries then Tesla yeah. would theoretically be worth 1.2 trillion on batteries alone on batteries alone that's right okay is- and and their margin is even better because because they're so vertically integrated that they can make more from their from the batteries I like that thinking I did not think that yeah. about I did not Think about that with CATL. So, how did you get six million cars? And is that twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five that you see six million cars? Because I see six, um, I see five million cars in twenty twenty three, and rapid growth. Yeah. So, there, I definitely think that that's possible. I just want to have something where, you know, even in this uh, conservative case, there's kind of like no, you know, it's not like oh. I'm requiring people to believe that they'll start knocking out the factories and, and ramping them and, and doing all that kind of stuff, which I think will happen. But I wanted to have a more conservative case. All right, let me it. let me let me bounce my idea off you on the number of cars, and I'm going to go to 2023. Yeah. Let's go to 2024. Okay. So I see uh, Fremont producing more than 500,000 cars. Let's call it 600. Mm-hmm. I see yeah. Shanghai producing more than that, like 800. And I'm, I'm, yep. I'm talking about right now, just the factories that we know about, not talking about future unspecified factories. You with me? Yep. I'm with you. I see Berlin producing 2 million cars. Maybe one and a half, but I think 2 million cars. I think if mm-hmm. you look at the Model Y factory section, they've got eight gigapresses. Mm-hmm. Each gigapress produces 1,000 um a thousand castings a, a day, mm-hmm. and there's eight gigapresses, but one one casting is only half of the car, right? It's only it's mm-hmm. only you need two castings per car, so you got basically yeah. four pairs of gigapresses producing a total of four thousand of the of the castings for each car a day, so four thousand cars a day from that. If you figure mm-hmm. they only operate two hundred and fifty days a year, which I think is pretty pessimistic, you get to a million cars for the Model Y. Right. Build a Model 3 factory, which I believe they're planning to do. Eight gigapresses. you got a million Model 3s mm-hmm. and a million Model Ys. That's two mm-hmm. million out of Berlin. Yep. Same thing in Texas. I'm expecting them to mm-hmm. produce a million Model Ys and a million Model 3s out of Texas. And I'm expecting them to produce Cybertruck. Yep. And I think it would be optimistic to say it, but you know, Cybertruck might be half a million. But let's mm-hmm. call it 300,000 because that's the target they've stated. So you got 2.3 million out of Texas. You got 2 million out of uh, Berlin. 
and then you got about a million and a half between Fremont and Shanghai. That's pretty close to six million, and that's twenty twenty four, really. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Really, I I get them around five, and then oh sorry, and then you've got the twenty twenty three compact, right? right? They've announced right. they said Battery Day that they're planning on building the next generation Giga factory between the San mm -hmm. Battery Day and Sandy Monroe's interview with Elon. I think we mm -hmm. can expect um, the next generation Giga factory, which is going to be more productive than the factories they're doing now. Yep. Um, building the Tesla 2023 compact, whatever that means. I think it's going to be a variety of vehicles, but whatever. If, mm -hmm. if the Model Y line produces 1 million vehicles a year, then a compact line should produce at least 2 million a year. Yep. And I, I think it might be 3 or 4 million a year. So right now they're building two factories at the same time. Once they've finished ramping or, or made progress ramping, Berlin and Austin, they're going to start building the next generation Giga factories, and I think they're going to build one in China, the United States, and Europe. They're not building mm -hmm. the current generation, the 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 Shang, the, the Berlin, Texas ones. They're not building in China. I think they're going to yep. build the next generation Giga factory in China, and Texas, and maybe in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, if those Giga factories are ultimately going to produce at least two million vehicles a year apiece, and I think it's going to be more than that. Then by mm -hmm. 2024, they won't have fully ramped by 2024, but they'll be on their way. I think you mm -hmm. might see another 3 million vehicles there, and you might be at 9 million vehicles in 2024. Why is that crazy? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it is crazy. I think um, it, it is something that uh, definitely could happen, especially with when you factor in things like their um, giga presses, save, according to Sandy Monroe, the um, guy who breaks down the cars, he said that they'll save 30% of the factory space from that. So, so that means you could put in two more lines in Fremont. And then you could expand Fremont to 800,000 cars. So, and then same thing for the China factories and, and on and on, that you can get each one of those more efficient. And you can make, like I said, with an uh, generation factory making the 25,000 car and just start really cranking them out. The, the thing is that uh, because if they can execute, and all the opportunities that they have, which is, you know, they're doing fairly well on, they definitely hit the numbers that you're talking about. And then you add on the FSD autopilot thing, and then you add the insurance, which all rack up far more with the, with the more higher numbers. Then you get to you know the really large numbers, even bigger than you're talking about, because you do your twenty thousand dollar share price based on. Well, I'm including you know, robo. I, cars. My twenty thousand yeah. dollar price includes robo taxi. Okay. Yeah. If you if you're but, uh, if you uh, limit me to uh, no robo taxi, I probably get ten thousand dollars a share, ten trillion dollar market cap in twenty twenty six. Yeah. Going a little further out because in twenty twenty six I'm at eighteen million vehicles, which sounds crazy, but that's why yeah, I get the numbers. Building, right. If they're building factories, you know, one year uh, to one and a half years uh, at a time, and they cost them two billion dollars or something like that, they have. $20 billion in cash and they're throwing off, you know, $5 billion uh, in, in free cash flow and then ramping that increases, then they can start really pumping out a lot of factories with the demand that's there. Yeah. Um, which, you know, so it definitely, I, I think that is definitely a possible thing to happen. And um, you mentioned insurance. I generally do not include insurance in my models or I put, I include it in miscellaneous. Why do you mm -hmm. think insurance... Like and my my take on it is once uh, FSD is up and running, insurance goes to zero. The cars stop having accidents. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. not to say zero, but much much less. And as the cars have fewer and fewer accidents, and then you know, if I'm a customer and I buy a car that drives itself, why am I paying mm -hmm. for insurance? The car's driving itself. Tesla's responsible if the uh, car hits something, not me. Yeah. There could be some regulatory things, you know, different regions would, would still require insurance. That's that's possible. The other thing is that it's kind of like a, a trade-off. Like before you have robot taxis, you have a fantastic insurance business. And I'm unsure how the regulators handle things after robot taxi exists. So it's a it's a kind of like um I'm looking at it in terms of what really the the current business models, how does that really go? as you kind of like dial it up before it transitions to something else, right? 
So they get, they get more and more profitable, even though they don't quite get over the finish line to robo taxi yet. Once they do, and I I really believe that'll happen, then you get an even more profitable model. But you're switching right. off well, certain other. Well, I mean, think think problems. about this for a second. Suppose mm -hmm. Tesla said we're going to base your insurance on how often you drive versus how often the car drives. Whenever the car is driving, you're not paying for insurance. So if 90% of the mm -hmm. miles are on autopilot, you know, full self-driving, and you, you're not required to pay attention, then we're liable when the car is driving. So we're going to lower your insurance mm -hmm. premiums 90%, right? Because 90% mm -hmm. of the time you're not driving the car. Right. We're covering it the 90% of the time we're driving the car. Well, mm -hmm. that makes it a really attractive car to buy. <laughs> right. So, right. So, um, but that means that you don't get a lot of you get your F, that that boosts your FSD revenue, right? If if I could pay ten thousand dollars for FSD and it meant my my auto insurance premiums dropped ninety percent, right now I'm probably paying <clears throat> two thousand dollars a year car. Let's say I'm saving eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah. No, probably paying more than that. We'll call it two thousand dollars a year. I'm saving eighteen hundred dollars a year on my car insurance. Well, that offsets a lot of the FSD price. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, I, I just, my, my take on it is insurance goes to zero once full self-driving takes over and it's not that big of an item. Uh, it's potentially profitable, right? If, if you're charging people for insurance and you're getting the same, like a slightly lower price than other people are paying, but mm -hmm. Tesla has much better sense of what's dangerous and Tesla reduces the number of claims because the cars drive safer. Well then. Tesla is going to make money on insurance because they're getting almost the same money with a lot lower claims. But for me, it's just, right. you know, what's the point? You're, you're not going to have claims at all, right? So, 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 so the, you shouldn't have insurance revenue at all. Right. So, well, it depends upon how the regulator, regulators work. I, I don't think regulators will, will be as progressive as you think, and they'll, they'll keep the old insurance model around longer, especially, you know, in different countries, different regions. The other thing is that, uh, you know, if it does last, you know, for some reason, robot taxi is delayed. The 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 number of fleet cars, like you know, like I'm making 10 million cars every year, but I've already gotten 100 million cars out there. If I'm making two thousand dollars per year on 100 million cars, right? Because I've been operating for 15 years, then the insurance thing becomes really big, right? Because it's all your old cars, not just your new cars, are paying you that couple thousand, three thousand dollars every year. And that's where it really racks up, especially if it's if you made it very safe. But it's, um, I think, a regulatory thing. Like until, you know, the regulators say, yes, we're allowing you robot taxis and we're and self driving, and we're gonna we trust it so much that we'll take off the insurance. There'll be a lag, right? They won't. They will. You know, they'll, they'll approve it, but then you still have, to have insurance until you you know many years of no accidents. Then, you know, then they won't take it off. In the meantime. They'll make a lot of money from insurance until it, you know, they start dialing it back. Yeah. Okay. So what about Tesla energy? What do you see as test? Where do you see Tesla energy in 2024, 2025? Um, it, it does seem to be going um, a bit slower. Um, I think as they get, um, you know, they have the 4680 batteries and they're not battery constrained, then they can do a lot more of it. Um, so, but, I, you know, because we haven't seen the ramp yet, then, um, you know, eventually if they, they get the utility battery and that, it'll become as big or bigger, like, like Elon was suggesting, the 10 terawatts for utilities and that kind of thing. But um, the timing is something that I'm not as confident about in the next few years, that um, I think utilities are kind of slow to decide things and people... You know, I'm, you know, I'm buying solar for my house, get, get Tesla solar panels and get power walls. So I see that ramping up, but um, um, I'm not sure of the timing when it'll happen. It will eventually be big. I'm just unsure of how it scales up and, and how fast we get there. Okay. So let me bounce a couple of things off you. So for me, for Tesla Energy, what happens is, CATL is scaling up there. I think you actually had this in the uh, PowerPoint you shared with me, that CAT yeah. CATL is planning to scale up their production of lithium iron phosphate cells. And lithium okay. iron... Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lithium. I don't know what's going on there. So lithium iron phosphate cells are particularly useful in 
Mega Pack and the Tesla Compact. And mm-hmm. I think, let me just look through my your PowerPoint here. I think I saved that page. I think we're expecting, let's see, 2024. Sorry. I should have had this page ready, but I, I didn't know where. Okay. By 2024, we're expecting 830 gigawatt hours from CATL and 1200 gigawatt hours or 1.2 terawatt hours in 2025. Yep. So if Tesla buys half of the 830 gigawatt hours, that's a lot of mega packs and compacts. Yeah. Um, and so my my numbers for, I think I had 400 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate cells in 2026. This looks like it might be even earlier than that. So I think mega pack really scales up and and. The way I see it, Megapack right now is not a huge moneymaker because mm-hmm. Tesla hasn't built the machine that builds the machine for Megapack. They mm-hmm. need to build the machine. that They need to build the factory. They don't have enough batteries to build Megapack to scale, so they haven't built the machine that builds the machine to build Megapack at scale. And once right. they start building Megapack at scale, the cost of building Megapack goes down. Um, mm-hmm. They currently sell Megapack for a ballpark of a million dollars. Three megawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate cells bought in quantity should cost one hundred and twenty to one hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and that's the primary cost in the mega pack, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're selling it for a million, and your primary cost is one hundred fifty thousand, and you built you you figured out how to build it to scale, your cost to build it shouldn't be much more than two hundred three hundred thousand. So yeah. ultimately, you sell it for six hundred grand instead of a million, mm-hmm. you get fifty percent margins. Right. And you sell an outrageous because if you look at the cost, the, the the way the costs work, they get a lot of tax breaks and tax credits and other things when they do mega pack, and that's how you make it attractive to the to the buyer. The might be an office building that has a mega pack. It might be a big store that has a mega pack, um, or it might be utilities that have mega packs and and a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like, well, you look at it and you say, you're, okay, it's going to save us this much money each year. They do this thing called peak shaving where the, the price of electricity jumps from like 4 to 9 p.m., let's say, when the demand mm-hmm. is highest. And so right. what they do is they use the grid or solar or whatever to charge up the mega pack. And then at 4 o'clock, they release the Kraken and they let the mm-hmm. mega pack start powering the building or the store or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. while the price of electricity is high and that saves them money on the cost of electricity because they're not paying the peak rate. It's called peak shaving. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it takes, you know, it saves them, you know, this much money every year. And mm-hmm. it's like year seven or year 10 that it starts paying for its, it's already it's paid for itself and it starts becoming a net positive and they start making money on it for the next 15 yeah. years after that. Well, if you lower the price by from a million to six hundred thousand, then you've massively, you've rapidly reduced the payback period, so that it's paid off in three or four years. Now, a lot more people want it because the economics of buying Mega Pack are a lot more compelling. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I don't know. Somebody keeps mentioning Nevada building vehicles. Nevada is Nevada might build semi, but that's a small scale thing. Um, and people, mm-hmm. and just about insurance, people are saying, well, there's other things that are going to happen, like natural disasters. Yes, but the primary cost of insurance is car accidents, and there's going to be a lot fewer car accidents if you have self-driving mm-hmm. cars. So, sure yeah. that you could still be vandalized. Sure, you know, uh, hail could still fall on your car, but that's a much mm-hmm. lower, smaller source of claims, and so the cost of insurance goes down a lot. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, so uh, what do you think about my description of Megapack? That they buy a lot of lithium iron phosphate cells from from CATL. They scale up production of Megapack. They get a lot more efficient at making Megapack, and they sell in a lot more volume, and they get fifty percent margins. Is there anything in that story that you don't buy? No, I, I agree that the supply side that they will be able to supply it. It will um, provide um, value. I'm just unclear on the demand side, you know, because you have these incompetent utilities like PG&E here in California and um, Edison and whatever in, in Los Angeles. And that I think that those, those companies will screw things up and not do things right. And so even though this would stabilize the grid and help, especially if you ramp up more solar as they're mandated to do, 
um, in a lot of cases, especially if the new infrastructure bill passes, then there will be, a, you want to have batteries to go with all of that solar and wind and all that kind of stuff. And um, also even for the regular stuff, just for high responsiveness. It's just that it could, because they're, a lot of these utilities are not good companies and oh, right, not let, good decision makers. Let me just take yeah. something on here for a second. I think there's a perception that I had that I've changed my mind on. Okay. The primary customer for Megapack was utilities. And I think that might mm -hmm. be true. But the presentation mm -hmm. that I saw, I have a video where I went through this. If you check my, mm -hmm. for people, those who are watching, if you check my channel, I think if you search for Megapack, you'll see it. Um, the primary customer that they talked about in this particular presentation was office building, large retail mm -hmm. store. Um, you know, okay. think about a large retail store that had, like, let's say a Walmart that mm -hmm. has all these freezer units and uh, air, uh, refrigerated units and all this mm -hmm. lighting. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. 150,000 square feet of floor space. Yeah. Um, that store can probably get, could probably use a mega pack. An office mm -hmm. building that is 10 stories tall, probably use a mega pack. An apartment complex that has a couple hundred units. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worked out it would be about one mega pack per like 200 units. So if you had an apartment building with 200 units, one mega pack. If you, what if you had an apartment complex with 1,000 units? I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of scenarios where it makes sense to deploy mega packs. Now, the apartment scenario, if the tenant is paying the electricity, then maybe the landlord doesn't care. But if the mm -hmm. landlord is paying the electricity, or if the landlord wants to offer, let's say it's a luxury apartment complex, and you want to offer people a sweetener, hey, we're, mm -hmm. we, you're going to have power when the power goes out, and you know mm -hmm. I'm going to cover the electricity. I'm going to raise the rent a little bit, but you don't have to worry about the electric bill. Or, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that would work, but I, I, could, I think there's a lot of potential customers that aren't utilities. Um, and yeah, then, yeah. And, so a, a great business, yeah. And then the other, there's a couple yeah. other stories there. One story is, I think we're going to start seeing more solar farms and wind farms, mm -hmm. and solar farms and wind farms need mega packs. Period. They need them. Not really. It's not like if it's if it's a, a regular utility. Yeah, they don't necessarily see that they need them. But solar farms and wind farms, they need them. And then the other thought mm -hmm. was, what if Tesla just starts creating its own mega pack farms? Right. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. just like we're, I've talked about Tesla deploying its own robo taxi fleet. It's not just me talking mm -hmm. about it. Elon talked about it on Autonomy Day, having a ten million yeah. vehicle robo taxi fleet for Tesla. Mm -hmm. Um. What about the possibility that Tesla just starts creating their own mega pack farms? Is that is that a crazy idea? Um, Tesla and SpaceX uh, seem to take matters into their own hands. So people weren't buying launch, so they got Starlink and, and started doing more launches. And um, I see that um, you know Robotaxi they talked about also having their own fleet, you know, for that kind of thing. So if the market moves too slowly, then of course Elon will. He's already doing solar. So yeah, solar and battery makes sense. So then him oh. pushing that forward. And Fred, 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 Fred Frederick, by the way, mentions Meg, uh, Megapack will be wildly popular with industrial customers. So it's not just office mm -hmm. buildings and stores. It's also factories. And, mm -hmm. and you know, if, especially if you're in a country where the power is unreliable or you're in a place where the power is unreliable, like Costa Rica or California <laughs> or Texas, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you run a factory and your power goes out for six hours, how much money do you lose? So right. number one, it protects you from that downtime. And number two, it helps you do the peak shaving. So there's a huge, huge demand. Mm -hmm. and, and as Ken says, batteries are a limiting factor. As CATL scares up their production of batteries, 2024, they're shooting for 80, 830 gigawatt hours, 2025, 1200 gigawatt hours. If Tesla's going to have 500 gigawatt hours of lithium iron phosphate cells to use in each mega pack, is three megawatt hours. That's three hundred and thirty-three megapacks per gigawatt hour times five hundred is a lot of megapacks. <laughs> and and with the auto bidder, which is the um, energy version of autopilot, where they're you know helping you to generate more money from the um, from the electricity arbitrage pricing stuff, then the the companies factories. Uh, um, large office buildings, hotels, whatever, then they would be more motivated to do what you're saying, buy the uh, 
the mega pack. So just hotels like another good example. Residential buy the power. Any hotel with two hundred units is probably going to want a mega pack. That's right. right. Get the price down; they're going to want it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would definitely put that more into my model to look at that more closely. Okay, so I want you. You sent me this PowerPoint, and one of the things you have mm -hmm. in your PowerPoint is main Tesla advantages. And the first mm -hmm. thing on your list, which I agree with pretty much all of this, by the way, but first thing on your list was mm -hmm. that Tesla's battery cost at $82 a kilowatt hour versus others paying, you have a range, but call it $150 a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Why does Tesla get their batteries for less than Ford and Volkswagen? Um, in your model, sorry. In your model, why are they getting mm -hmm. batteries for less than Ford and Volkswagen? Well, the the... Pricing is is from um, you know, Sandy Monroe did the analysis. He said it was eighty dollars a kilowatt hour, and then there've been other analysis by Karen and others where this about like a hundred. Everyone agrees that Tesla has the lowest prices on their on their batteries. Um, they are you know other companies you know I think um, Volkswagen buys from CATL as well. Um, one maybe because they're doing some with um, I'm, I'm not sure why, you know, the price, other than the fact that they're buying a lot more, that they're buying more batteries and they got that in their earlier, right, let me, they better deals. Let me, let me throw uh, out I'm why I'm sure about that. Let me throw out why yeah. I think they're getting, they keep in mind, different batteries cost different, different battery chemistries cost different amounts. So Tesla is using nickel, cobalt, aluminum primarily for its vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they're getting their nickel cobalt aluminum batteries for less than others are paying for nickel metal, nickel manganese cobalt batteries, which are comparable roughly because they're made mm -hmm. in Tesla's Gigafactory by Panasonic. It's a partnership. So they're right. made on Tesla's location. So Panasonic did not have to fund the building of the building. And I think they mm -hmm. had a deal with Panasonic that you're going to give us a break on these batteries and, and we're going to work with you on improving your technology. And I don't know how much of the technology in the Panasonic batteries Tesla's using comes from Panasonic. And how much of it comes mm. from Tesla figuring out, hey, we could do this better. Let's change this. And there's a lot of mm. intellectual property sharing that benefits Panasonic and gets uh, justifies a lower price. Um, in mm. China, Tesla is using CATL uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. And I would assume that BYD, for example, pays roughly the same. Since BYD produces its own batteries, they might even be paying less. But Ford and, you know, you sort of have to ask the question, who are the competitors? So in the United right, States, right. I, I would say they don't really, I tend to think Tesla doesn't really have competition. In the, mm -hmm. in the electric vehicle space, it's really that the EVs are competing against internal combustion engine vehicles. 98% right. of the vehicles sold in, 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 in the world in the last year were internal combustion engine, 2% were EV. The goal isn't mm -hmm. to beat out the other EVs for the 2% of the market. The goal is for all EVs to beat out ICE for the remaining 98% of the market. Um, but I, I think, and it's, then I guess the other, other car makers are using pouch batteries and other kinds of form factors. I think is Tesla's true. the only one using the, the, the cylindrical cells. So there's another cost difference between different kinds of batteries. Lucid Motors is using 2170 cells, but they don't produce any cars yet. So we can talk about them later. So mm -hmm. uh, another advantage you mentioned that Tesla gets more range for the same kilowatt hour battery pack. I think that's painfully obvious. I don't think we even need to dive into that. It's just mm -hmm. transparent that Tesla's getting more, you know, they just have better battery management. They have more efficient vehicles. It's just working. Um, another thing you mentioned, balance sheet. So Tesla had, you have Tesla with 20 billion in cash. I think they have a little less than that, but call mm -hmm. it 20 billion in cash. And they have, I think it's $9 billion in debt. I'm not sure if that's still true. I think it's about right now, 9 billion debt. And, you know, like Ford has over 100 billion. Volkswagen has maybe 200 billion in debt. A lot of the car companies have more than $100 billion in debt, the big car companies. Yeah, all the big car companies have over hundred billion, it seems. And that's like an, that's like an anchor around their necks, right? Right. And also it's their business model too, because they, they do all the leasing of cars. So they're taking a lot of debt for their um you know, corporate and um and consumer clients where they're taking the, the debt for the in order to lease cars out. So their model is I'm getting a vehicle and I'm doing all this financing where I'm making money. On the financing of the vehicle. All right, I got to I got to bounce something off you here. Yeah, I frequently hear. In fact, just 
today or yesterday on Twitter, I'm always getting the Tesla Q thing that, oh, Tesla doesn't make money on selling cars. They make money on EV credits, uh, uh, regulatory credits. They make money on Bitcoin profits, whatever. All right. Which is completely not true. They didn't make that much on the Bitcoin sale. Um, mm-hmm. They sold, you know, they, they made some. But they didn't make that much. Um, right. When you just described that they, they borrow money and then they lease the cars out, it's like, well, Ford, first of all, Ford doesn't make money at all. Or it lost like 1.3 million last year. But to the extent that they make money, they make money on financing cars. They make money on parts, mm-hmm. right? You know, they, they don't really make money on selling cars. They make money on the other stuff that goes along with selling cars. Am I, right. am I wrong? Am I, in the, am I correct? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very correct. Um, certainly for, um, you know, Ford and GM, probably to extent to Volkswagen, maybe Toyota. You know, have the profitability where they can make it straight off their cars. Um, because they're, I think they make about twenty billion dollars per year, something like that. So, but all the other ones, especially Ford, like I said, on a normal, air quote, normal year, where they didn't lose money. You know, they they just had a presentation where they said, "We're going to do better than four percent margin. We're going to get to eight percent, right?" And that's you know, doing that's off their ICE vehicles and other things. Um, so. And then they're definitely losing money for Volkswagen off every EV they sell. And then they're offsetting that because they get to sell a SUV without paying Tesla for it. You know, they could just sell their SUV without a, a penalty or, you know, like kind of like uh, trade the penalties, you know, like I'd uh, sell a profitable SUV. And then, and even there, like not that much profitability because they make so much on the finance and the service of the vehicle. Okay. So. You have better margin and capital efficiency. I think you're talking about CapEx. Can you explain why Tesla has better margin and capital efficiency? What, is, what, is it, well, what does it mean and why? Uh, well, that goes to the margin is, um, so they make uh, you know, automotive margin, I think it's about like 24, 25% um, from that. So they, they, they sell $10 billion in a quarter. They make $2.5 billion uh, from the auto margin before they take away um, you know, their operational expenses and other things um, off, off the vehicle, um, which then drops it down to, you know, they make um, net income of $400, $500 million, um, which is increasing. So, you know, Ford and, and the other companies have, especially Ford, at far less margin, you know, around that 4 to eight, 4%, they're trying to get to 8% level in, in four years. Um I think Toyota has a pretty good margin around 20%, um, but all the other car makers have less, which is why Toyota's the, the strongest of the traditional car makers. And then, um, so that was margin. And the second part of it was, you yes, asked about was... Um, oh, capital yes, efficiency. Um, capital efficiency. Yeah, so um, um, Tesla's gotten far better at, at building the factories and... Um, and then Kathy Wood uh, discussed, um, you know, the first um, Fremont factory they built and cost, um, I think, for fourteen thousand dollars per car per year. So if they make five hundred thousand cars, you need to, need to spend seven million dollars to to make that. But their newer factories are far more capital efficient. I think they're down to like five thousand, seven thousand dollars of uh, per car per year to to, to get the. I think it's less. Than, and, it, and isn't it less than that? I mean, if you build Shanghai Giga for two billion dollars, is I think the rough number, and you yeah. produce, let's say, in the long run, you produce, the factory runs for ten years and produces seven. Let's say six. Well, let's say uh, six. Let's call it ten million cars because that's probably too much. But let's say it produces ten million cars on two billion dollars. Mm-hmm. That two hundred isn't that two hundred dollars a car? Year. No, it's it's cars per year. So it'd be like if you're producing five hundred thousand cars per year. No, no, but I'm, I'm just saying if you have a two billion dollar factory, you amortize it over ten years, and it's two hundred mm-hmm. million dollars a year. And if you produce a million mm-hmm. cars a year, and it's two hundred dollars a car, it's they're not producing mm-hmm. that many cars a year. But you know the next generation factories are even more capital efficient. So I I, I don't think it's five thousand dollars a car. I think it's like five hundred dollars a car or less. Well, it's a five thousand dollars a car per year. So I'm talking about the capacity cost. So if you're making a, if you have a million car per year factory, right? 
and you spent $2 billion, and then you beat $2,000 um, based on the, uh, that particular metric. You know, you're, you're, that lifetime cost of cars is a different metric than the car per year capacity metric. So that, that's the, the um, But if, right. if Tesla gets the 4680 and then reduces the cost to invest by, by half, then again, all these capital efficiencies keep improving. And so, so here, here, here's my thing about this. So what, what Tesla does is, number one, they build the factories very efficiently, mm. right? They, they build the factory for less money and mm. they build it to produce a much higher volume. So they build a factory and they produce, let's say, 500, long run, maybe they produce 500,000 Model Ys out of Shanghai. That's probably a little optimistic, but let's say they're going to produce 500,000 Model So when Ford builds a factory, maybe they're going to produce 50,000 or 100,000 vehicles of this, this is the thing, like Tesla doesn't have this wide variety. Like you look at BMW, if they got the X3, they got the three, they got this version of the three, they got that version of three, they got the two door three, they got the four door three, they got the three convertible. Yeah. Um, Ford, and like Ford makes like 4 million cars a year, I think worldwide. Right. And they have so much variety. They got all these different types of pickups, the F-150, 250, 350. They've got, you know, I think that most of the American car companies are stopping making sedans, but they've got all these SUVs and everything. Mm-hmm. They have a much more diverse product line, but it means each vehicle ends up being produced in much lower volumes. And then you have to spread the R&D and capital expenditures end up being higher cost per vehicle. Yeah. Am, so am Ford I correct? Has, uh, has 10 factories uh, for um, final assembly and uh, and. Um... Um, construction of their other vehicles. They have globally. Like, what? Yeah, is that uh, in the world or just in the U.S.? That's in the world. Um, but then they have um, eighty other factories for various parts and things. So, like for transmissions, for this and for that, and then they, they buy the stuff. So they, you know, uh, the but there's, I think ten ten major factories. And again, it's like each one does, like you say, uh, different vehicles. You know, two car two car types here. But the, the reason yeah. they have to do that is because their models are not, um, you know, huge. Um, not, not, and everything in the F-150 where you make a million of them. A lot of them are, you know, these um, less popular brands, which, um, you know, they only sell 50,000 or, 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 or many vehicles that they sell of those things. So then they have to like, okay, I'll make three of these models here to get to, to use up 500,000 vehicle capacity. Um, yeah, because yeah. with ten factories, you're averaging four hundred thousand. So most of them are far smaller. Yeah, you know. So and then you have all these other supply chain things coming into it that are building it, and they're building another dedicated EV factory. They have one EV factory in Mexico that's, that's assembling the vehicles there. And they invested about like eight hundred some million dollars into that, and then they uh, to, to convert it over. But again, they, they're not making most of the stuff there because I'm pretty sure they're they're getting the um, the batteries and the and the um, skateboard from from Volkswagen. So just doing the last, putting the parts together thing there, and then um, they're building another Rouge factory, I think, in to to in Dearborn to, to be dedicated for their F one fifty construction. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna racially profile on you on something on your sheet. You mm-hmm. talked about FSD. That thirty percent of the people buy it at eight to ten thousand dollars, but only one to two percent buy it in China. And you mm-hmm. look like you look by, both by your name, Brian Wong, and by your face, yeah. you look like you might have some family knowledge about family history knowledge about China. So what mm-hmm. what can you tell me about why people in China? If you if and me like I, one of my best friends is named David Chang, and mm-hmm. he doesn't know anything about China. His father was born in Taiwan. His father was born in China, lived in Taiwan, whatever. But but mm. my buddy Dave doesn't know anything about China. So it's not fair for me to ask that question to some extent because I, I know Dave would be like, why are you asking me that? But yeah. um, do you feel like you have some cultural knowledge of the country China and why they don't buy FSD and what might get them to buy FSD? My only theory about it, and, and one, I'm assuming that you know, the information I got is correct that they're at that one, two percent level. So it, the information could be wrong. I think, I, think Tesla I, said, I think Tesla said that. I think they've said that yeah. they have very low take rates. So, so my theory is that the roads are somehow um, bad or inferior or, or the some aspect of China roads is somehow problematic for the current version pre 
um, FSD9 beta that, that has trouble with those roads. You don't think it, you opinion. don't think it's a cultural thing. You think it's a it's a quality of the roads. I think it's, it's the, the, the roads impacting the quality of the experience for the people who are using drive in certain place conditions because there's um you know China has a lot of new infrastructure, but other areas are very um, rough. So if somehow you had to drive on on roads that were uh, challenging, not well marked, or somehow some kind of problem there, then that could somehow make FSD in the current form not work as well, is, is my theory as to why that is. Thus, if you improve FSD with you know the new beta and stuff like that, that could make it far more attractive. Because I don't think it's a cost issue. That um, the, the wealthy people in China, you know, um, you know the, um, the luxury bags, the, you know, the Louis Vuitton, all that kind of stuff, half of the luxury goods go to China because you know, the wealthy people in China are really wealthy. So it's not that they can't afford it. So it must be somehow that they that it doesn't work as well for them. It might Is there the theory that the wealthy people hire a driver and there's a prestige to having a? I heard this theory mm -hmm. that the wealthier people hire a driver, mm -hmm. and there's a prestige to having a driver drive you around. And if the car was driving you, if so, they don't they don't want to be seen at the, right now. It's FSD can't drive itself. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to sit in the driver's seat because they want the prestige of having a driver. Now, you get to the point where the car can drive itself, you know, without you being in the driver's seat. You can sit in the back seat while the car drives you around. That might become a prestige thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe I, there may be the, just the prestige of I've got this employee working for me and you wouldn't want to get rid of that. I don't know. That would be for those kind of like uh, Mercedes and, and, and uh, limo type vehicles. Um, I'm not sure a Tesla vehicle would be. Well, maybe for for having a, a um, person drive you that, and also maybe the parking issue. Maybe that that um, if I need to have the driver in order, to, this parking may be terrible in certain areas, and so they have to have the driver in order to get the you know get dropped off instead of switching around for parking <laughs> issues around. Right. Well, it's just there. There's this bizarre. It's easy for them to find a driver for fairly low price, low right. wage. In China, right. it'd be harder to find somebody to do that for you in America. And if you found somebody to drive you at fairly low age, they probably wouldn't be that good of a driver. Yeah. So I lived in in the mid nineties in um, Hong Kong for a couple of years. And yeah. Everyone has maids because it's very affordable and it, it makes things a, a far better. And um, the same thing in in the Philippines and other places like that. So I would think that Asia has a lot of availability of low cost service labor would um, make the scenario that you're describing where they have a, a driver and then need it because of the convenience and stuff like that. So they don't, you know, haven't needed um, self-driving. Like, that okay. could be a factor. All right. Yeah. So do you, you met, you list that leader in full autonomy and you mentioned Huawei and comma.ai. Mm -hmm. I, my impression is that Tesla is leading in self-driving and no one else is close. Um, that there's right. There's I was this... just looking around for com competitors. Um, so um, Waymo was always cited as the top competitor, but now they you know lost their CEO. They seem to be you know redoing some stuff. You know they're still talking big game, but they you know it was just like you know Blue Origin for, for Rocket. They just have been doing stuff and haven't been able to scale up and do big things with it. You know because Tesla makes you know billions of dollars per year from autopilot and FSD. And Wayne was making, you know, nothing. So um, I was just looking around for any new kind of entrant that might be coming up with something. And, well, let me put it um, this way. Ultimately, the prop, if you believe that the answer to self-driving cars is machine learning, mm -hmm. everything I know about machine learning, you need, a good, you need good algorithms, but you need a lot of data to throw at your machine learning so that it has enough to learn from, so that it sees enough, so that it can learn how to drive a car. Mm -hmm. And no one is anywhere close to the amount of data Tesla has on True. what yeah. what you're going to see in the real world. No, I mean, not not like no one has half. No one has one percent of the data what Tesla mm -hmm. has. Um, so when yeah. I, when I saw some demonstration, I don't know if it was Huawei. Am I pronouncing that right, Huawei? I saw this oh, yeah. demonstration in China, and it's like they're driving in an area where there's not much traffic. 
it's like a corporate mm-hmm. park or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like some, I don't know, some, some area that the Chinese government created to have like warehouses and factories or whatever. And there just aren't a lot of people around. There's not a lot of cars driving around and sure it can. And what we never know when, whenever we see a demonstration of another car company's, uh, self-driving software, what we never know mm-hmm. is, is somebody watching and they have a, they can joystick the car if they need to. Mm-hmm. Waymo apparently yeah. we now apparently know that Waymo does not do that because right. of the recent incident they had and so the car got stuck. Um mm-hmm. with the Huawei thing like I you just can't tell when Mobileye did their demonstration in Israel when Huawei did this demonstration in China you can't tell whether somebody's joystick and I'm not saying they're joysticking it all the time it's pretty clear that anyone mm-hmm. can dis- not anyone that most major car companies can ha- can have a car that can stay in the same lane. And can break if yeah. a, if a vehicle in front of its brake lights come on. You know, there's certain aspects mm-hmm. that we know. You know, what is it called? The uh, speed. It's like cruise control that can adjust based on the traffic. That stuff all exists, mm-hmm. but there's a higher level of decision making that FSD is working on that I don't think anyone else is close to because they just don't have the data. Am I am I right that no one else has the data? Does mobile I have more data than I realized? Does Huawei? Who else has anywhere near this much data? Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm not aware of anyone else that has as much data. You know, they, uh, Waymo talks about simulated miles, but I don't think that really counts. Um, but the, I would just cite those others just because they have a model where they want to retrofit other people's cars, where they potentially could get to, you know, a lot of into a lot of vehicles and get a lot of data. So they they have the potential to do that. They haven't done it yet to a great extent. I think Mobileye probably has would have the, probably the most installed units. I'm, I have to look up exactly how much they have, but they have a model of, of you know providing it to other other car makers. Okay. So so just going through these advantages again. I'm looking through a, a, a PowerPoint that Brian sent me. Those who are new, this is Brian Wong. Brian uh, runs NextBigFuture.com and history in the corporate world, history as an angel investor. And he has a lot of thought. He's a Tesla bull, maybe not as bullish as me, but he's a Tesla bull and we're bouncing our ideas off each other. So the last thing you have on this list of main Tesla advantages is that Volkswagen is losing $4,000 a car. The Leaf is priced at $12,000 below MSRP. Um, let's start with Volkswagen. Where did you hear that they're losing $4,000 a car? Are we talking about, first of all, are we talking about the ID3 and ID4? With Volkswagen, yeah, I agree. So where did you get yeah. that they're losing four thousand dollars a car? I think they're losing money. I just don't know how much. Um, I have to find the reference that I had on that. I, I saw that, but also I seem to recall them make Volkswagen themselves make a statement that they were looking to get to profitability in EVs in twenty twenty five. So their statement that they're going to get there means that they're not, not profitable now. So before, all right, before we go to Leaf, because you have Leaf listed, Ford. Yeah. Had this event, I'm I'm obsessed with with the Ford F-150 Lightning because I I think it's a beautiful vehicle actually, but the same thing with the Mustang Mach-E. There's no way in hell they can make these cars without losing a ridiculous amount of money. So right. I I looked at the Ford F-150 Lightning. It is basically a Ford F-150 Super Cab with a five and a half foot bed. They're including the 2.4 kilowatt hour power package on the standard model it's four-wheel drive and i priced out basically the the vehicle that they're going to sell as the forty thousand dollar vehicle would sell as a fifty thousand dollar vehicle with a gas engine and you've got to add a fifteen thousand dollar battery pack to it and i'm like all right so normally you would sell this for sixty five thousand dollars and you'd make a maybe you'd make a profit on the same. Now keep in mind you would normally have a markup on your fifteen thousand dollar battery pack, right? So you'd right. probably sell it for seventy or or seventy thousand dollars in order to make money on it. You're going to sell it at forty. They got to be losing at least ten, maybe twenty thousand dollars a vehicle on the F one fifty Lightning. Am I? Am I? And and, yeah. and the Mach I sa- I don't have numbers on the Mach I sat in the Mach I watched somebody drive it um, on a racetrack. Maki's a great. I I like the Maki. I like the the F one fifty Lightning, um, but there's no way in hell they're making money on these cars. And again, then you have this other issue, which is, 
I think they're basically targeting 50,000 vehicles a year. Well, that's where the mach -E. <clears throat> Both. Each one. I think each one, they're, they're I don't think they I think can... they're targeting 8,000 150. The, the, the How many? target. That'd be 80,000. All right. Well, so the R&D on coming up with these cars is really expensive and you got to amortize that over the vehicles and the factory to build the, the vehicles. You got to amortize that over the vehicles. So if you built a billion dollar factory to build your Mach-E and you got to amortize that over 50,000 cars and Tesla built a two thousand a two billion dollar factory, but they built five hundred thousand dollar cars then your CapEx without even R&D, your CapEx on the Mach-E is five times as high. And then you've got the R&D cost, which is 10 times as high per car. Mm -hmm. So how are, they, how are they not losing an arm and a leg? On, like, it's almost like, well, we have to sell some of these cars to make it look like we're doing something, but we can't sell too many because we're going to lose a ridiculous amount of money on each car. I, mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I, I don't see how they don't lose like crazy money on each one of these things that they make. What do you see on that for the for the F-150 Lightning? Let's start with that. What was your what was your take on the F-150 Lightning when you saw it? So it's um, basically they they took the regular F-150 and they stuck electrical parts and batteries into it, um, and then they made some minor, um, you know, grill work change, added the little light band onto it. So they basically nice, nice frunk. They got a nice frunk. Right. Yeah. So they they basically you know, did this quick translation of, I have an F-150. If you like the F-150 and want an electric version, use the electric version. I stick, you know, stick the, the top of it onto that vehicle. So uh, that's what I, I thought. That Sorry, they, let, they let, did me, let me pause you for a second. Yeah. First of all, thank you to Gary for the question. I'm going to answer your question in a second uh, or address your question in a second. Giovanni says, why is it hard to believe they're making money on these cars? So Giovanni, I just want to say this again. I just said this. Go price out a Ford F-150 4 uh, x 4 Super Cab. No, sorry, Super Crew. I think it's Super Crew. The bigger one. Mm -hmm. With a 5.5-foot bed. Add in a $15,000 battery pack. Add in a 2.4-kilowatt-hour charging thing and whatever other options come with the F-150 Lightning. You come up with a seventy thousand dollar car, and they're going to sell it for forty grand. That's the problem with that. But let me turn to Gary. Uh, Gary, thank you for your support. Gary says, "What would the ROI be on a five billion dollar chip foundry? Would there be any surplus to compete with?" I think he's saying TSMC, and I'm not sure who NXP is. But let's just we're going to take a diverge from this for a second from our, our where we were. If there's talk about Tesla building their own chip factory, I don't know how serious it is. I've never heard Tesla say anything about it. Do you think it makes sense for Tesla to build their own chip factory? A foundry? Um, I, I'm i not sure what this is. I don't think that would, that would make sense for them because the chip foundries are, are very expensive, especially because they're buying um, the um, the latest, you know, TSMC or, or Samsung 5 nanometer, 7 nanometer chips. And those things, you know, are very expensive and take a lot of time to do. So... Um, it wouldn't make sense for them to do that, I don't think. Um, it's better to t more tightly partner with Samsung and TSMC to, to, to get better chips and that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm sorry. Um, maybe for some other components, like maybe they have some other kind of chip that they need that's somehow a cheaper factory where you can just go off the line just so you can get microcontrollers that are, you know, you need for your thing. But for the main chips, I think for the FSD ones, it wouldn't make sense. Okay, so I agree with you on that completely, but um, you were, we were talking about the F-150 Lightning. What, I, I'm sorry I cut you off there. What's your take on the F-150 Lightning? Yeah, so I think that they, they, they made, took their, their regular F-150 vehicles and did modest changes to it. And, but, you know, the internals, they just switched over in from ice to a battery and electric and then said, we're, we're done. Here it is. You know, you're like an F-150 ice. Here's an F-150 EV. Um, so, you know, which makes sense because they, they, they are successful with the F-150 uh, ICE, so they want to carry that over. Uh, but it's going to take share from, from that. They're, they're, it's like they're killing their own F-150 ICE over time because they don't want someone else to do that for them. So they're also doing that, and I think they also have the Rivian and whatever. So the traditional truck guys, you know, that's what they're going for. Um, but, I, yeah, I agree that they're losing money on, on every one of them that they make. Is there 
Is and, there a um, prospect that they can make money on an electric F-150 in the future? On, on the one that they showed? Um, it's going to take a while because, um, you know, right now we, we're saying that they're at 130, 150 bucks per kilowatt hour. And then their target, I think, was $100 per kilowatt hour, you know, so you know, in four, four years. So their, you know, cost structure is not improving that rapidly. And they're not, they're buying a lot of stuff off the, off the, off the shelf from suppliers. They don't, you know, make the machine, they make the machine, they don't make the parts, they make the parts, whatever. They're, they're assembling parts from many places. Um, so, yeah, they have a long road to, especially if, if the prices keep dropping because of Tesla being more and more efficient, then that leaves less room for them to price in a vehicle that's profitable. Let me, let me ask you about the, my math on something. So mm -hmm. Ford told President Biden that the battery pack on the F-150 Lightning was 1,800 pounds. I think they were referring to the 300-mile range uh, Platinum F-150 mm -hmm. Lightning. That's about 800 kilograms. And I did some math, and I figured, mm -hmm. okay, let's assume at the pack level they're getting 250 watt-hours per kilogram, which might be optimistic, but mm -hmm. let's just go with that, 250 watt-hours per kilogram. That gets you to a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack and at a hundred dollars a kilowatt hour which they're not at yet at a hundred dollars a kilowatt hour that's a twenty thousand dollar battery pack now for the 230 mile range one you'd have a smaller battery pack that's where i got to the fifteen thousand dollar battery pack. i think it's actually more i think they're actually spending twenty thousand dollars on the smaller pack and 25 or more on the on the bigger pack but you're starting with a twenty thousand dollar pack and then it weighs so much i mean you know this is the thing that got me was there's this classification for tr pickup trucks of gross vehicle weight rating of more or less than 8,500 pounds. There's this dividing line at 8,500 pounds. And that's a combination mm -hmm. of the curb weight of the vehicle, how much the vehicle weighs empty sitting on a scale, and then the mm -hmm. plus the payload that it can carry, which is passengers and stuff in the bed and, and the front, I guess. So Tesla's planning on Cybertruck having a 3,500 pound payload. <clears throat> well... If it's under 5,000 pounds, that keeps it under the 8,500 pound mark. And I believe Cybertruck might get down to 4,500 pounds or less, which is stunning because that's the, the Model X weighs over 5,000 pounds, by the way. So mm -hmm. even the refreshed Model S, which has lost weight, weighs over 5,000 pounds. <clears throat> but I think Cybertruck, because of the exoskeleton design, the structural battery packs is going to come in under 5,000 pounds, maybe even as low as 4,500 pounds. I have a, a few videos where I talk about that. If you look at my channel for Cybertruck weight. Um, the F-150 Lightning, the, the 230 mile range one is going to have, it's going to weigh 6,500 pounds and have a 2,000 pound payload to keep it under 8,500 pounds. This is from Ford's VP of marketing, uh, Mike Levine replying to my tweet. Mm -hmm. He said it'd be 6,500 pounds and have 2,000 pounds of payload. Well, the larger battery pack's going to weigh more. So I think that's closer to 6,900 pounds, maybe 6,800 pounds, and it's going to have a 1,700 pound payload. So basically, a Cybertruck's going to have twice as much payload. It's like you're trying to design a useful truck, but then you're taking away all the usefulness, right? Mm -hmm. So right. I, I, you know, I, I think it. I don't dislike the look of the F-150. I mean, I like the Cybertruck better. Don't get me wrong, but I think the F-150 is a good looking vehicle. I, I have thought at times about buying an F-150 or a Silverado or whatever, a pickup truck. Um, I think it looks good. I think it's way better than a gasoline powered pickup. That's actually a question I have for you though. How do you think the F-150 Lightning stacks up? Let's say the $55,000 one with 230 miles of range and a 2000 pound payload. How does that compare to an F-150 XLT? Like compare the F one fifty Lightning with batteries to the F one fifty XLT mm. with gas with a gas engine. How do you see those two comparing? I have not uh, compared the specs of the uh, of the F one fifty XLT ice vehicles. I'm not familiar with it. Okay, yeah. So I I haven't really thought about that. I think that's the big question. Is this because especially mm. the two hundred and thirty miles of range, and then it's cold weather, mm -hmm. and then you've got this. Mm -hmm. You got some payload in the vehicle. I think the average pickup truck buyer is going to say, well, I can go 400 miles 
and my gasoline truck. I mean, I don't know. They have to get mm-hmm. 20 miles a gallon, have a 20 gallon tank so they can go 400 miles. Um, mm-hmm. That's not going to be very, I don't know how appealing. I think if you're somebody who just drives to work and back and you have the truck for the look and you occasionally carry mm-hmm. payloads in it or use it to move some stuff, but you never drive long distances in it, maybe that mm-hmm. maybe that's compelling. Um, or you just want to have an EV and you think it's cool. But I think ultimately, from a practical standpoint, the gasoline-powered F1, I mean, you probably save money on the operating cost over time because gasoline trucks use a lot of gasoline. Gasoline is expensive. You got oil changes. You got other things you don't have to do with an EV. I wonder what the total cost of ownership is going to be on an F-150 Lightning over five years versus an F-150 gasoline-powered XLT. I Well, I think... Um... EVs have far better cost of ownership, you know, in general, even, even you know, slightly inefficient EV would have a, I think, better cost of ownership. And sorry, that brings me to one other thing, which is one of the things about all the other competition, any, any competition that's not using lithium iron phosphate battery cells, okay? We don't know what the cycle life is of their batteries. So we're, we're mm-hmm. pretty confident that the average Tesla is going to get half a million miles, if not a million miles on their battery pack at this yeah. point, moderate. The latest Teslas, we're pretty confident they're getting close to million mile range, you know, uh, cycle life, million mile life. Maybe some of them are, you know, half a million, but there's definitely, you know, a, a 400 mile range Model S only needs 2,500 cycles to get to a million miles. I, I think they've got that. Um, 500 mile range Cybertruck is only going to need 2,000 cycles to get there. So I, I think I think they're getting there. But like. Is this F-150 only going to last 100,000 miles and then need a new battery pack? We don't know. We don't know what battery chemistry they're using. We don't know what battery management system they use. You know, there's a lot of factors in here that mean that they're probably, and especially if you have only 230 miles of range, you're probably, you're probably going to charge to 100% all the time because you only have 230 miles of range, where if you have a Tesla with 350 miles of range, maybe you're comfortable charging to 80%. And and for people who don't know, the batteries last, the nickel-based chemistries last longer if you only charge to 80% and you only discharge to 20%. But if you have 230 miles of range and you only use 60% of the range, now you really only have 130 miles of range. <clears throat> right? If you Yeah, so Tesla definitely has the best uh, durability on the, on the batteries. You see them in the resale where they don't drop off much in resale because the batteries hold up. The, the Nissan Leaf, um, yeah, I have friends who, who bought them and, and the battery are going after the second year. And you see that also in the, in the resale prices, which, you know, just, you know, cratered. Part of that, the, the low range of the early the Leafs, but also it's because their their batteries degrade have, far worse. You have this note here that the Leaf sells for $12,000 below MSRP. What do you mean by that? So I think it was the, the Leaf and, and the Bolt and stuff like that. Um, the, you know, the old, I think they may have repriced the leaf, so that they've come up with a new one where they don't do the big discount on MSRP. But I think the the Chevy Bolt and I think the the, the Nissan Leaf had higher pricing before, where they like okay, the twenty twenty or whatever model was twenty twenty one was um, thirty nine thousand dollars, and then they have uh, you know call the dealer for the price, but then the twenty twenty two model thirty one thousand. So then you know they because they had to adjust the pricing probably competition test, so then they. The, the previous year model, they were discounting massively. I think I, I remember seeing that. I think for the Leaf, and I think yeah, and I the, think I, I think Nissan is discontinuing the Leaf, or they're coming out with a new SUV called the Aria. Aria, I think, yes. I think that's been delayed. All right, so let's move on here. Um, let's talk about Tesla Q. Mm-hmm. Tesla Q says the stock price is too high. Mm-hmm. Well, Elon said the stock was too high, so. <laughs> Uh, and you wrote can be true for months. Um, I think the stock price is too high is sort of like this vague statement, like, well, because I just had this conversation on Twitter today. It's like, well, you know, it's priced higher than Toyota, it's valued higher than Toyota. It's like, well, yeah. So my let, my take on this is really simple. Tesla is a profitable company that is growing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a profitable company that is growing. And yep. generally speaking, when something is growing, you expect more profits in the future and you're paying a higher price because you're expecting to get those earnings in the future. Yep. My perspective on the OEMs, the Fords, Volkswagens, GMs, whatever, is that they are losing money and they are shrinking. So there's a theory, if you have a mm-hmm. company that's losing money, if you think you're going to grow out of your losses, 
like Uber and Lyft have that. Uber and Lyft lose money, but the story is they think they're going to grow out of their losses, which is a conversation we won't get to today. And I think that the OEMs will probably get back to profitability now that COVID's over. And although the shortages, I'm not so sure. But if mm-hmm. Tesla grows fast, like I think and you think they will, then they're going to cut into the car sales of the OEMs, which means they're not going to grow. On, on average, right. the OEMs will not grow because Tesla is growing faster than the whole market. And that means mm-hmm. that the other OEMs have to lose sales overall. Somebody, you know, a particular company might hold on to sales, but somebody's losing sales and maybe a lot of them are losing sales. What's mm-hmm. your thoughts on Tesla's current stock price? Is it priced too high? Is it priced too low? Why is it too high or too low? The current stock price, I think, is, is um, probably low. I think it's, um, because, especially because, um, you know, back at the end of January, it touched 900 bucks. And then, you know, it slid for the last four months, probably also because of the, you know, the overall tech market being down and overall markets with the inflation worries and that kind of stuff. But now at, at the, the 600 some bucks, I see imminent catalysts that will take the stock price back up. One is July 1, your Q2 delivery number will come out. The FSD beta is about to go, you know, uh, available for download and that kind of stuff. Um, possibly at the same time they release the um, the monthly um, subscription for FSD, to, which will get more people to try it out, increase adoption. And then also we have in in June the um, um, well now the the tenth I guess the the Model S refresh delivery will come out. Which will increase stuff. So it's several cows, and then the potential of the huge um, uh, infrastructure bill, which probably will take till August to pass. But if that passes, then ten thousand dollar credits per vehicle, uh, virtually unlimited for the next five years, and also thirty um, percent um, subsidies for the um, for the um, um, battery plant. I think is, is also in the, in that thing and. and other subsidies for the charging station. So all that would, um, if it passed through any form, would be a huge boost for Tesla. Um, and then Q3, Q4, um, I, th- I see, um, you know, Dojo coming out. Itself. So there's a bunch of other catalysts in, in Q3, Q4. And, and in 2022, we're, we're looking at $2 million, $2 million cars plus per year. Um, 2022 will, will look um, massive. Okay, uh, so let me, let, me, let me give you my take on this. I see Tesla being worth three to five. Well, your your numbers were three to five thousand dollars a share, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five. I think mm-hmm. my numbers are higher than yours, but let's go with five thousand dollars a share in twenty twenty five. Um, what would you pay today for a stock that's going to be worth five thousand dollars a share in four years? Right. Well, I would think you'd pay half at least. Yeah, twenty five hundred. Yeah. So $600 a share seems really cheap for a stock we think is going to go to $5,000 a share in four years. Um, right. And it's, uh, my take on Tesla stock is this. Anybody who's looking down the road and sees, oh, excuse my French, but holy shit, they're building two new factories and these factories are going to be more productive than the current factories. So they're very clearly planning to more than double production within mm-hmm. two years. Yeah. Right. Once these from right. today, those factories aren't online yet, but they're going to ramp 12 to 18 months. So if the factories start producing vehicles in six months and they ramp in 18 months, two years from now, your total production is going to be more than double your current production. Mm-hmm. Seems like they're not having trouble selling the cars. So it seems like the company's going to four X really five or six X in less than two years. Well, that's a good sign of growth. Mm-hmm. And all while they're doing this, they're lowering their costs, they're improving their capital efficiency, all the things we talked about. So, and then we know on the horizon they're planning to build more. They're planning mm-hmm. to build more factories. So, to right. me, it's like you have to be deliberately not looking at the future to not see that. So, that's one side of it. The other side of it is there's FUD, there is media trashing Tesla constantly, there mm-hmm. are, um, Wall Street, Wall Streeters, people like Gary Black, who 
send conflicting uh, people call Gary Black a bull. Gary Black is a short term trader who sends negative messages about Tesla all the time. Um, I don't know if you know who Gary Black is, but yeah, I do. I, I follow he's, him. He's yeah. on Twitter. You know, uh, we we don't get along. He blocked me. I blocked him. But um, hmm. I occasionally see his tweets because I have more than one account. Um, and you actually you can see him without being logged in. So anyway. There's all this negative messaging from Wall Street, and there's this mentality on Wall Street that's very short term. There's a lot of mm-hmm. short term. Tra- Actually, one of the big drivers is just short term traders who are looking at these trends and resistance and all these other numbers that are, to me, mumbo jumbo bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it's like, well, what's the long term value of the company? It should be trading near the long term value of the company. Mm-hmm. That's simple for me. Yeah. So my thinking on this is, you go down the road a couple of years and all of a sudden Tesla's not making half a million cars a year like they did in 2020. They're making 5 million cars a year like they will be in 2024, let's say. Mm-hmm. And a lot more people have Teslas and a lot more people have friends who have Teslas and a lot more people have ridden in a Tesla. And then there's mm-hmm. an article in Jalopnik trashing Tesla, which is very common that all these publications write articles trashing Tesla. And now, uh, right now, there's assholes like me who are writing in emails or trashing them and saying, you guys are jerks. Mm. Well, what if 10% of their audience has personal experience with a Tesla and says, well, that's stupid. I know, I've been in a Tesla. It doesn't work like that. Mm. You know, as Tesla's market grows, as the, the penetration grows, as there's more Teslas in more places, as more people, like we, we have the boring company loop in Las Vegas, which we might talk about later. Or, you know, more boring company loops gets deployed and people visit Vegas and they ride in this and they ride in a test like, oh, this is nice. As people get personal experience with something, the negatives start to make the people saying the negatives look bad rather than make the target look bad. So I think that I think we start to see a shift when Tesla starts producing more cars. And then the other thing is. I think a moment comes when Tesla becomes the big dog. Like they pass, like when they're making 5 million vehicles a year, they're bigger than Ford. When they're mm-hmm. making 10 billion million vehicles a year, they're bigger than anyone else. And there's a, right. there, sometimes there's a Wall Street premium on the big dog. Mm-hmm. Right? If you're the big right. player in the market, there's a perception that you're going to hold your value lo- well, better than other car companies. I don't actually believe mm-hmm. in that theory, by the way, but I think it's common. It's a common view on Wall Street, or at least it has been a common view on Wall Street. Mm-hmm. So... I see uh, this moment in time, there's going to be, like, we always talk about inflection points, like there's the growth curve and at a certain point, they get to a certain mm-hmm. point where they can't grow that fast and the, the curve bends yeah. back. I think there's an inflection point on the media and on Wall Street where all of a sudden Tesla's the biggest dog and so many people have experience with Tesla that writing negative stories about Tesla hurts your publication, right? All of a sudden people say, well, mm-hmm. I don't want to read your shitty publication. You're trashing this brand that I love, Yeah. right? And I think that could actually lead to like an overshoot. So then mm-hmm. you and I, you and I might think, well, on traditional valuation, Tesla's worth, let's say, ten thousand dollars a share. But mm-hmm. the media swings the other way, <clears throat> and Wall Street swings the other way because of the big dog theory. And all of a sudden, Tesla goes to fifteen thousand dollars a share when you and I might say ten, mm-hmm. right? On our right. sort of semi-objective analysis, do you right. think that that scenario of like? the media being forced to change by the audience and and Wall Street changing because of the big dog hypoth the big dog theory do you think those hold water um so i think the um also the the numbers themselves you know if 2 million cars next year they're making 500,000 cars per quarter you know 25 billion dollars of, of auto revenue versus 10 billion and you know margin of say 30 percent that's um you know like 700 what what 7.5 billion dollars of uh of gross margin and then the five billion dollars drops to the bottom line then all the pe things you know you know kind of go away unless the because the, so you're transitioning as you're into these next level things and if you're proving out FSD and with other stuff, you're each point you're getting to another level. So it's it's less like the debate about Tesla with the Model Three is different than with the Roadster. So Tesla's changing the facts on the ground. 
rapidly. And we can see that, you know, whatever quarterly, whatever production things, if they complete the the Berlin and Texas factory and start ramping that up, then, you know, they, they do that so profitably then that there's, you can't even talk about, oh, well, blah, 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 their revenue, well, their revenue is now more than Amazon, right? So, you know, and they're doing it via, with the vehicle, then they have, mar, you know, Amazon like margins or something like that, or, or, or higher margins. So, or TSMC margin. It, it goes to what the, um, 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 Pierre Fairgrew was talking about with his analysis of um, cash on assets, where they go from 20% um, cash on assets and he's projecting out to 40%. So, if they're that capital efficient and throwing off that much cash, it becomes less an issue of do you believe it? Do you know they're a cash printing machine? Let's right? let, let's dive so, in, let's dive into Farragut's analysis. Can yeah. you explain what Pierre? Because I've read it and I'm not sure I understood what Pierre Farragut's view is. So could you explain to the the audience and me what mm-hmm. what Pierre Farragut was saying recently? Pierre Farragut just said this really bullish thing about Tesla, and I don't claim to understand it. So. Maybe Brian, you can explain it to me. What did he mean by this? What was his story? Uh, Pierre, you know, Pierre Fergus uh, heads up a global technology infrastructure research team for New Street Research. So, tenure, you know, very experienced analyst. So he was talking about cash return on operating assets. So excluding credit. So basically, it's like I have assets in my factories and in my machines that are making stuff, and I'm generating so much cash out of it. So. Uh, for 2020, automotive revenue of uh, 27 billion dollars, and then he's saying that the of that 23.8 billion is the operating assets. So four billion is for other stuff, um, operating cash flow. So he's looking at a pure cash basis. So then he takes out certain other factors, and he says the uh, return on operating assets is in 20 percent that he's getting back. You know, four point six five billion dollars off your twenty three billion dollars of um, of assets, and basically this came up from negative three percent in twenty seventeen, up to ten percent in 2018, 2019, and twenty percent. So basically, it started throwing off a lot of cash, and that was basically the the model three introduction. So what what are and he wait wait, wait what are operating yeah. assets? Operating assets or factories? What are operating assets? Yeah. Our factories, the equipment, um, everything that, that you're using to to make the stuff that the, um, the stores are money. probably included in operating assets too, and the and the yeah, supercharger stores, stations. Yeah. Okay. Right. So charging network. So yeah. they, they their operating assets have grown from ten billion dollars in 2016 to twenty four billion dollars in 2020, and you're saying the return. So what is return on operating assets? What is that measure? He's measuring the the um, the cash. I think probably related to the free cash flow. I think I think is what it is. Okay, but maybe, the, maybe on this that, page I've got from you, it's operating cash flow. Mm-hmm, yeah. Does that sound right? Operating cash flow. So they they had yeah, four point four billion dollars in operating cash flow in twenty twenty on twenty three point eight billion dollars in operating assets, and that works out to about a twenty percent return on operating assets. Is that the rough? That would be about one fifth. That's, right? that's the way I read it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, why does the return on operating assets matter? Because it's it's the um, the cash you make from from the stuff that you're you know using to to make money. It's like um, you know Walmart stores, you know whatever you have to put in in order to to make it. So I had to buy the hotel. I'm getting so much cash out of it. So I'm, you know. Is this sort of need to, to do a, is this sort yeah. of like a duality with with capex and capital efficiency that if you if you invested twenty three point eight billion dollars in building up your operating assets and they're spinning off four point four billion dollars in positive cash flow, that's really a lot better than if they're only spinning off a billion dollars in operating cash flow, right? That's right. And so yeah. I think the question is how does that operating return on operating assets compared to a Ford or a Volkswagen or a Toyota or, and I think you have the, that. Their next I think that's your next chart. Yeah. Yeah. So they say BMW does 7% while Tesla does 20. 
and um, they're saying that they get three per three percent better because of better battery cost, three percent better because they don't have the dealer network. You know, all the the, the dealer companies that are kind of separate uh, companies that they don't own, and then two percent is the fact they don't advertise that they can sell cars without advertising. Another five percent because they have you know the common platform between the Model 3 and the Model Y and the Model S and Model X where they share platforms. That reduces their, their cost because they can hey, you're, make more cost. You have this with, chart here. Uh, sorry. Mm-hmm. See that? And, and this chart, I'm sorry, I can't put this up for people, but basically what we see is BMW has a declining cash return. on op- BMW has done well in the past. BMW was making 33% cash returns on operating assets. And that's declined to 20% and probably continuing to go down. Daimler has been in the 15 to 15% range steady for a while. And Tesla's climbing. And I think Pierre hmm. sees Tesla going up to like 40%. Right. Right. And that, right. that probably doesn't include RoboTaxi. No, doesn't include RoboTaxi. Right. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this to people. We'll, I'm not saying I understand this, so let me try to explain this. So think about any business. Like you want to open a Dunkin' Donuts store, like a donut shop or a Burger King or whatever, and you got to pay half a million dollars to create your McDonald's. You know, you're paying McDonald's money, you're paying to build this, the, 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 the location and whatever, you and you pay to buy all the equipment. Let's say it's a million dollars because it's easy to work with. And... You end up making a hundred thousand dollars in cash a year that you net that you take you take out. That's not bad. You're making ten percent return on your investment, right? That's not bad. Ten percent a year, that's pretty good. If you could make it twenty, that would be a lot better. If you could make it forty, wow, that's a really good you basically make your investment back in two and a half years. And then you're just making money endlessly. You're making this ridiculous pile of money. Um, and really what happens is the thing that you built is worth a lot more than what you spent to build it. And without RoboTaxi, Tesla's going to that 40% soon. And that means that when Tesla builds a factory, it pays it pays for itself in two and a half years, or actually probably the newer factories pay it for themselves in less time. And you're just spinning money. You're just printing money. You're just making a lot of money. And if you build your factories with more capital efficiency with better cap you're you're more careful with your capex if you build your factory so they're more productive then you're just making a lot more money and you're also able to and tell me if i'm if i'm going too far here brian you're also able to um basically lower the price of your products to be more competitive because you're making so much money that you can afford to cut your profits a little bit if you ever face pricing pressure, right? Which right now Tesla doesn't even face pricing pressure. Tesla's actually raising prices for a variety of reasons and they're selling every car anyway. It's like, it's almost stupid that Tesla sells the cars as cheap as they do. They probably should be charging more for their cars because people they basically have un- effectively unlimited demand, but they're able to keep prices down or lower prices as needed because you have this cushion that you have this big you know, cash flow. Am I making sense, Brian? Yeah, well, I think I would say it a couple of ways. One is that um, if you have 40% return, you have that two and a half year payback. That means, you know, you can turn around and and invest again and make another factory, you know, within two and a half years or two years or something like that. You know, you, you can turn around and make things a lot faster, especially with if you have the demand there. So if the demand there, then they're, you know, you know, one factory, two factories, four right, factories, well, eight factories. Let me turn that around. Faster cycle. I, I see Tesla. They're going to finish. They're going to have substantially ramped for Giga Berlin and Giga Texas. And they'll be making money on those factories. And they're, still, they're not going to have paid off the factories yet. But they're going to have twenty a $20 billion plus cash pile, let's say, end of this year. They're probably going to have a $25 billion cash pile by the end of this year. Or maybe they'll pay off more debt, but whatever. And the next generation gigafactories, I, I really believe that the, the real story behind Tesla is not the current set of factories and the ones we know about, but the next generation gigafactories we don't know about yet. We have hunches, we have theories. Search my channel for next generation gigafactory if you want to see the video I made about that. 
But if they can build a next generation gigafactory for say $1 billion because they've gotten more efficient with their capital expenditure and they have 25 billion in the bank. And I've had people say, Warren, they can't do this. I'm like, well, why don't they build three or four at once? Like they're building two now mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. They take the learning right. from building these two factories, say, okay, now let's build four more. But we're going to build four better factories that are even more CapEx efficient. We're going to do single piece giga casting for the entire car. We're going to use 48 wall wiring. They're going to have other improvements that we don't know what's coming yet. So that I think by the end of 2022, they tell us, okay, this is what we're doing for the 2023 compact. Probably before the end of 2020, maybe by the end of this year, probably sometime next year, they tell us, okay, here's the plans. Here's what we're going to do. And I think they build three or four next generation giga factories that produce three or four million vehicles a year each when they're, when they're fully ramped. So that's why I get mm -hmm. to 2026. I get to 12 million vehicles from the next generation giga factories and 6 million vehicles from the current factories we know about. That's 18 million vehicles. And then you throw in semi and a couple other things and you end up with 19 million vehicles. But, um, right. Which is what, um, the, um, you know, the current forecast by analysts or whatever, you know, generally, you know, 3 million to 5 million or, or less in 2025 or something like that, or, you know, like 8 million, 2030. So if they start pumping out factories and say, okay, we make four, then that's the whole repricing of the, of the share of the curve. So basically like, you know, the crap is happening thing, you know, crap, you know, right now there's still, for whatever reason, some doubt around how quickly they can ramp Berlin and Texas and, and all those kind of things. And, and also the, the 4680. Once they say, okay, this has now happened, then you reprice and the stock jumps up. Yeah, and the, you know, the whole. Yeah. And this is the thing. So I understand that there's some risk that the 4680 doesn't work. I think it's a very small risk mm -hmm. at this point, but there's some risk. There's some risk that something goes wrong with the manufacturing plants in, in Berlin and Texas. I think it's a small risk, but there's some risk. But it's almost like the market is pricing it as if it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right, and and there's no. I know they're, they're pricing stuff like uh, like for Volkswagen or Ford. In, like Volkswagen said, in on their power day, we're gonna make six factories by 2030. Each one be 40 40 gigawatt right. hours. So basically, 240 gigawatt hours. So basically, they said we will be more than ten times smaller than Tesla with their three terawatt hours. And then GM and Ford are saying, well, we're gonna have. 40 or, you know, 120 gigawatt. Again, it's I like, think you're, I think for Volkswagen gonna said, have, we're going to have less battery production in 2030 than Tesla will have in Berlin in 2025. Like Tesla right. will be producing more than 240 gigawatt hours of batteries in Berlin in 2025. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, sorry. So, um, I just feel like they're not pricing in. Okay. Let's let's suppose you were an analyst and you say, okay, this is where I think Tesla's gonna go, right? I think they're gonna get to four million vehicles. I mean, and you have to look like most people look and say Tesla's gonna make eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand vehicles this year, and that's without yeah. the two factories having significant production. So mm -hmm. for twenty twenty two, I think they easily make two million vehicles. That would be a 4x growth from 2020. And, and you know, there's two reasons for that. One is you've got your 800, 900,000 from the existing Fremont and Shanghai. Shanghai. I, think they, I think they actually get to a million. And then you get Berlin and Texas, which start ramping mm -hmm. pretty quickly. But that's 2020. Right, so they start ramping. So they only have to produce 500,000 each in order to get to 2 million. And there's this moment, I don't know if you, if you caught this, this is something I've been harping on a lot. During the Q1 investor call, Drew Baglino said they expect to get more than double the number of sales from suppliers than they get in 2021. Well, if you get double the number of sales, let's say you produce a 900,000 vehicles, you get double the number of sales, that takes you to 1.8 million vehicles. But then you add in Tesla's battery production. Right, but it's more than double from suppliers. So that takes you to 2 million and you add in Tesla's battery production. Maybe you get to 2.2 .2 or 2.5 million in 2022. Um, or though maybe some of the batteries are going into, maybe Megapack is ramping, maybe Powerwall is ramping. And so some of the batteries go into that and that increases more and that 
takes away a little bit from vehicle growth. But I, I see that, I see that. So I definitely think like, like 900,000 vehicles this year won't break the, 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 the mindset because they're sort of stuck mm -hmm. on that one. But I think you're right. Yeah. When they start pumping out 4680 cells, I really think like just June 10th, I'm assuming that June 10th, they actually deliver Model S Plaid, right? Because Elon put it off for mm -hmm. a week and you never really could put it off for another week. I, right. bought my, I bought my airline ticket to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to get in, but I bought my airline ticket to go. Um, if they, so I don't know if you saw this. I just put this video on Twitter t uh, tonight. Jay Leno drove the Model S Plaid at a drag strip. Not a video of him. Okay. It's just him. Oh, yeah. It's a video of him talking about it. He said mm -hmm. he did the quarter mile in 9.2 something seconds at 100. And mm -hmm. I, think he, I think he hit the quarter mile at 162 miles an hour. Let me, let me be clear mm -hmm. about this. He did zero to 100 and call it 150 miles an hour in nine seconds. Mm -hmm. Like there are cars that do zero to 60 and worse than that. Right. right. This is like insane. And, and that's with the air conditioning on. That's, with the, mm -hmm. that's a four door passenger car with the air conditioning on. Crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like this, this media thing again, when they, like, they're already delivering cars that are like outperform just about everything else. But when they deliver cars that are like so high performance that the journalists can't help but say, holy shit. And mm -hmm. I think when they start spitting vehicles out of this is an I, so I don't think Model S deliveries are going to be enough to sway the the analysts and the media. I think mm -hmm. when Berlin and Texas start delivering Model Ys that weigh 500 pounds less than the current generation Model Y, which is already, according to some journalists, the best car in the world, I could see that being a moment that shifts. Um, that shifts the media, shifts the, the the Wall Street a little bit. And then, like Elon said, 2023, they're expecting to deliver 1.5 million. He didn't say it in those numbers, but he thinks there's a chance to deliver 1.5 million Model Ys. I think he's sandbagging. I think 2023, they might do 2 million Model Ys. Um, because you, I think you get a million each out of, ultimately, as you fully ramp, you get a million each out of Berlin and Texas, just of Model Y. And then you've got mm -hmm. Shanghai and Fremont probably pumping out another 600,000. So I could see 2.5 mm -hmm. million model Ys down the road. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know. Well, model Y in April, outsold, it, despite China model Y production being shut down for two weeks, it outsold, you know, the Fremont and, and, Ch and Shanghai model Y outsold model three. Yeah. No, oh, so, and, you know. So you, you okay. just, if you just, when they, but when they start driving the Berlin and Texas model Y, which is going to weigh 500 pounds mm. less, have longer range, have better performance. The, the, mm. the car journalists who actually drive cars and give it, you know, the car and driver, road and track, motor trend, um, mm. Dan Neal from the Wall Street Journal, when they drive that car, they're, I, I, they're going to have the holy shit moment. They're going to say, holy, mm. I, like, I can't believe a car can be this good for this much money for this much, you know, that's, that's where I think it's going. Um, and and right. there's going to be this, recognition at some point like holy shit why would anybody buy a different car right and and they and then the rate of improvement is, is increasing because you know they they had the fremont model y and the main china model y the main china model y is better than the the fremont model y no no but what, they, what sorry to be clear what i mean is the berlin and texas model y is a step like shanghai's an improvement over fremont on the model y i agree with that the Berlin and Texas Model Y is going to be a step change because you're going to 4680 yeah, yeah. cells, structural it's battery pack, better. front and rear castings. It, it's 23 percent better. Um, li limiting factor. If I love the limiting factor channel, I don't know if you watch him, uh, Jordan Gisagi. Yeah, I do. He and I, I think it was on Twitter, so it was public. We were talking about this. We both maybe it was private. We we both think that the the Berlin and Texas Model Y will drop about 500 pounds compared to the current generation Model Y, which is not a heavy car, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, and what that, and it's going to have a better chassis stiffness, rigidity, whatever the right term is, it, because you're, yeah. you, you, you've reduced all the pieces. It's going to cost less to manufacture. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't see how this doesn't like break 
the journalists, the, the, the real journalists, right? I'm not talking about the fluff mm. journalists who hate Tesla and don't know anything about cars, but the guys who really drive right. cars. And I, I mm. wonder if that's the type of thing that causes a shift when, they, when you start seeing journalists, because Dan Neal did it with, it was almost like when Dan Neal did that with the Wall Street Journal, it's like, how did people not wake up? Mm. Right? So maybe that's not enough to wake people up. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm going on, a, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Um, as people can tell, I'm a crazy Tesla fan. I'm wearing my Elon fan club t-shirt. Check the, the links in the description below. And by the way, please support this channel on Patreon. Patre uh, thanks to the Vasa law firm in Sweden, all my Patreon supporters, um, uh, Patreon supporters get early access to some videos. I published a video today. My Patreon supporters got access to it. And my YouTube channel exclusive content members got at early access to that video that, you know, the night before they get bonus content, they get advanced uh, opportunities to submit questions to my, my weekly live stream and so on. So let me go back to where we were. Oh, one of the, I'm going to change gears for a second, unless there's something, did you, was there something else you wanted to say about what we were talking about or can I move on? Move on. Okay. So, um, there's this thing that we hear from Tesla Q. I'm, I'm going to leave Reddit, regulatory credits alone because it's such a stupid criticism. It doesn't deserve a response. It's like they make, that's the rules of the game. They make money on it. Um, when they make more cars, they make more money on regulatory credits. So where's the problem here? Um, and, you know, my model, by the way, my models do not include regulatory credits at all. I judge Tesla's profits having nothing to do with regulatory credits. I don't, I don't, mm. I just assume the regulatory credits go away. If they get regulatory credits, they make even more money. Fantastic. You have this reference that the regulatory credits make them so much money they can build new factories with the money, right? Mm. So there's this line, the competition is coming. We talked about the F-150 Lightning. We talked about how Volkswagen loses money on each car. I would say there is competition that is, first of all, I've said this before, the competition is internal combustion engine vehicles. More EVs means we displace more ICE vehicles. But I do think there are potentially some competitive EV makers out there, primarily in China, particularly BYD and NIO. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worry that NIO, like I think BYD, I have more faith in BYD because they make electric buses, they make their own batteries. They're doing lithium iron phosphate. Mm -hmm. they're, they have their blade battery, which I think makes sense. I don't know if they're going to be able to scale. I don't know if by making only lithium iron phosphate uh, based vehicles without structural battery pack if they'll really be significantly competitive but it doesn't matter if they displace internal combustion engine vehicles who cares i, I don't mind that at all i don't think they're going to displace tesla sales neo i think they're barking down the barking barking up the wrong tree going down the wrong path with mm -hmm. battery swap and i i think they're heavily subsidized by the chinese government there's this project called neo park spelled neo park instead of nio park but they're Chinese government is trying to push EV development. So do you think, um, and you say NEO is profitable. I, I think NEO is profitable based on subsidies, but I don't know. Do, do you see significant competition for uh, in the vehicles, in the EV space? And do you think any of that competition takes sales away from Tesla or does it just take sales away from ICE? So I think it uh, takes sales away from ICE as the, um, the EV vehicles, Everyone's, you know, especially Tesla's, keep improving every year. We said, you know, the Model Y will be, two, you know, two point will be a massive improvement. Um, I think that um, in terms of the, the competition, I actually did an article today where I looked at all the top selling cars in Q1 and looked at the ones that were, you know, I kind of broke them up based on the pricing because, like, there's this these China cars, like the 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 um, uh, the mini EV things, they're at like $5,000, $10,000. The Hong Wong the Hong Wong mini EV? Yeah, Hong Wong mini EV. Yeah. It's basically, it is a pure um, souped up um, golf cart. If you look at the golf it, cart, it looks like a death, five batteries. It looks like a death trap. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the, the, the China makers are, are in that non, you know, you, you can't say that a $5,000 vehicle competes with a $50,000 vehicle. You know, not, not the same buyers. And then also, so Tesla's starting at 41000 for the Model 3, 51000 for the Model Y. So even the $20,000, $30,000 vehicles are not currently competing in, in the same market. And that's a lot of the other uh, makers. So then when you look at only the ones that are 
price the same, same kind of features, then you know you have ID three, ID four at about forty thousand dollars. You have um, the BYD Han, but uh, it looks like to me that Tesla's got about half or more of the, of the market for the ones that they're directly competing in. So it's really that Tesla's coming to compete in the other market. They're coming to compete for the twenty-five thousand dollar vehicle. They're coming to compete in Europe more when they have the Berlin factory where they get ten thousand dollars of um, of taxes to go away. But now instead of a sixty thousand dollar Model Y at the fifty thousand dollar, and they get and they make it cheaper, it might even be a forty five thousand dollar vehicle. So their addressable market is going to you know explode as they compete more and more. And then the Cybertruck and the Cybervan, I expect, will compete with a large SUV market. So, and then competing against not just EVs but also, like I said, the ICE vehicle. They are outselling the um, Mercedes three class vehicle. I think it was in the, in the annual report where Tesla is outselling the direct apples to apples ICE vehicles of BMW and, and Mercedes, etc. So, so they're beating ICE. Yeah. Um, and as they make more vehicles, cyber trucks, et cetera, they will, you know, I'll compete more, more other vehicles, which is a huge thing for, uh, you talk about Ford, other vehicles, other co- companies, they did it on a lot of different kinds of models where they like, I make all these different kinds of things and making, you know, a Ford one F-150, a Honda Odyssey, uh, a category dominant vehicle is, and which Tesla's doing, is not something that other kinds displace. Like if you say, you know, all these hyper competitive car companies, none of them could displace the F-150. None of them could dis- displace the, the the Toyota Prius. It's like, where's your Prius killer? You didn't make one, you know? Where's your whatever vehicle? You know, Honda Odyssey, yeah. minivan killer. You know, you didn't, you didn't make it. So, right. you know, they, they couldn't stop the rise of Japanese companies. They couldn't stop the rise of South Korean companies. It's like, you know, I don't see this competition. Thing. Okay. So uh, I want to take a break from our topic just for a second. Digital Blade CA, mm-hmm. who is a channel member and a, a moderator on the chat, says he had a question for you about your angel investing story. So let's take a break from Tesla for a second and just tell me what kind of angel investing have you done? What, what was that experience like? What can you tell us? Maybe maybe you don't want to talk about it, but what can you tell us about it if you can? Um, well, I've, I've been involved in um, angel investment groups, the the Koretsu Forum, which um, is a uh, been around for I think over twenty years in, in the Bay Area. I've only with them for a couple of years, three years. Um, so I would go to their angel investment. I was also a member of um, Space Angels. So I've and I'm. Also, um, head of research for um, allocations, which is a group that um, meets on um, uh, Slack and um, well, it's like has 700 uh, accredited investors. Um, some are VCs, some are with some national groups and stuff like that. So I help to research them. They do a lot of um, space companies, anti-aging companies, some uh, top 100 um and anti-aging and uh, journalists and stuff like that, according to some uh, third-party um, firm. Um, so I've invested into um, nanotechnology before, still a stealth company, so I can't discuss it. Um, I got into SpaceX via um, the allocation of the group, so people can get um, into uh, special purpose vehicles that hold the shares, and then you can... They take quite a bit off of it. They they take like twenty percent or two percent per year, you know. So it's, well, let's let's it's talk about expensive way to go. Let's talk about it. the SpaceX investment yeah. for a second. So, my understanding yeah. is you can buy into a fund that's going to invest in a funding round, and then you pay like a two percent annual management fee, and you pay a twenty percent carried interest. And some people buy yeah. into funds that invest in the in the funds that invested in SpaceX. And they pay like a commission mm-hmm. to get into the fund that owns shares of the fund that owns SpaceX. So I think what you're saying is you don't own SpaceX shares directly, right? You own shares in a fund that owns SpaceX, or do you own shares in a fund that owns shares in a fund that owns shares of SpaceX? I, I 
own shares in a special credit vehicle that has the, the shares. Okay, so, so they because transferring the shares involves um, a board approval, so they have to stick it into this vehicle, and then the people who run it, you know, choose to get the twenty percent and two percent carry, and blah blah blah. So they, you know, they take the cut. And am, it's the only am, way to do it right am now. Am I right? Is it a two percent management fee per year and a twenty percent carried interest? That's the, the typical deal, although sometimes it's worse than that, like you know, three percent and thirty. And like then, that. But yeah, does the two percent per year end, or is it two percent per year management fee forever? Because I've, I've seen some. Management- I've seen some where they cut off at five years. They just get their management fee for five years, then it stops. Yeah, it depends upon who's putting the deal together. If it stops. When it stops. And for those who don't know, you carried interest is you you bought the SpaceX stock at a valuation of ten billion dollars, and then SpaceX has an IPO later at a hundred billion dollars. So the gain is effectively ninety percent or nine hundred percent, ninety billion. If you if you owned the ten billion dollars of SpaceX, now you just made ninety billion dollars. The f- the, the people who run the fund take 20% of the 90 billion. But, you know, let's say, let's say you had a million of the stock and it went up to 9 million or 10 million. They take 20% of 9 million off the top, right? Mm-hmm. So for people right. who don't understand how carried interest works. So like you could, then my, my theory, by the way, about buying stock in SpaceX is I've had opportunities to buy into SpaceX where I would have, paid, have to pay a 5% commission on top of what you paid. And it was like, okay, let me see if I got this straight. I got to pay a 5% commission, then I got to pay the 2% management fee, then I got to pay the 20% carried interest, or I could just buy Tesla stock, right? And, Mm -hmm. you know, do I think SpaceX is going to grow more than Tesla? When SpaceX is currently valued around $100 billion, so if SpaceX grows to a trillion dollars, well, I think SpaceX could grow to 5 trillion, maybe 50x, but I think Tesla might 50x. Right, but I don't have mm-hmm. to pay the commission and the management fee and the carried interest when I buy Tesla stock. So how do you how do you balance that? Buying Tesla, you, you could invest this money in SpaceX. W- when did you get into SpaceX? Um, a little over two years ago. Okay, so the valuation then so, was probably less than fifty billion when you got in. Yeah, I pro- it's probably gone up three times. I mean that since I, well, I got the last there, valuation was less than a hundred billion, but I think it really is worth a yeah, hundred like billion 80, now. 80, so you probably paid yeah, maybe. I think, I think, I think when I got it was about thirty billion something like that. Okay, so, so so if it goes to three trillion, you did pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, I have twenty times more Tesla stock than I have SpaceX. So right. you you got a chance to get in on SpaceX, so you got in. Uh, yeah, you got a little bit just to you know. Was because, it you was know, the special purpose SpaceX. vehicle only for investing in SpaceX, or does it invest in other things? The one I did was just SpaceX. Okay. And you've done some that. other venture capital funds? Um, I invested in, in another um, another startup that was doing some um, COVID vaccine. Um, I helped other people invest into other companies, other tech companies, because my site, you know, I've written 30,000 articles, over 30,000 articles on um, all kinds of advanced technology. Okay. So I get um, some deal flow. So I help people to... Um, to um, you know, match up people who want to invest with the the, um, the opportunities. Okay, so let's get back to Tesla. Um, the other thing you had written in the anti-Tesla story, which I've seen a lot, is that China will kick out Tesla, or that the Chinese government, the CCP, will somehow be bad to Tesla. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So, I don't agree with that um, because um, China hasn't kicked out Apple. You know, they want to have Apple there so they can copy it better. Uh, the other thing is that <clears throat> China has a <clears throat> bigger issues than um, just the, you know, the EV market and stuff like that. They have the massive pollution problem, which is costing them 7% of their GDP and, and impacting the health of people and also makes people unhealthy. When you're coughing up black soot and, and um, you know, getting your health reduced, you know, three years shorter life. You know, people get pissed off. So, if they can accelerate solutions to that, that's far better. The other thing is that China imports ten million barrels per day or so. You know, they they produce about three and a half million barrels per day of oil, and they import ten million barrels per day. So, one that's a huge geopolitical vulnerability. 
you know, they can get cut off, you know, by someone else's Navy from, from their oil. So if they replace all their trucks and they have 5 million trucks or whatever per year, they have, they have more trucks than we do because they're the, the world's factory, then that would reduce the amount of oil they need by 4 million barrels per day. So then, and they get all the vehicles, that's another million or, or 2 million barrels per day. So they reduce their oil dependency by half. It'd be like they, they two and a half times their current oil production, which, um, you know, the huge political thing, and they fix their environment, all that kind of stuff. And also with the vehicles, if they had boring company tunnels and that kind of stuff, solving their traffic issues, um, then they would improve. They, they're trying to make mega regional cities. So like the entire payroll of the Delta, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, like 60 million people, whatever they're, they're trying to merge that together. They're trying to merge together the area around, you know, 10 cities around Beijing, a bunch of cities around Shanghai into these mega super cities, which are doing a high speed rail and other stuff. But with um, self-driving cars, tunnels, and stuff, they can improve logistics within that. And China's all about logistics. And then that would improve their GDP. Because if you get a, if you double the population that's connected, you tend to get about 10 to 15% more GDP per capita. So this, you know, if you merge together 100 million people, that could potentially, from a 10 million, then that could give you a 40% boost in GDP. Uh, You're saying I, further ur further urbanization helps the GDP? Right. If you improve the density of connection of the, of the population, if you don't you know, okay. make it worse, you can do it efficiently. There were time and motion studies from you know the early 19th century which showed that you would get this um, per capita income boost. Okay. I want to follow up on this for just really quick. I want to thank Meet Kevin and Talos of Tech for... Uh, joining the chat and participating in the chat. For those who don't know, Kevin uh, Afrath is running for governor of California. He has a big channel. I'm a big fan of his. Um, so I just want to thank you for coming, Kevin. Um, you actually, I, this is a particular moment where I really feel like I got something especially valuable out of this conversation because I have had the view from the beginning that this criticism that China's dangerous to Tesla is stupid. And number one, like, Every country you do business in poses a political risk. I actually took a class in college called political risk analysis, right? So Berlin, we're seeing issues with bureaucracy making it difficult to get the factory going. If you wanted to go to India, there's all these regulatory issues in India, licensing, whatever. Um, frankly, Alameda County was not terribly friendly to Tesla, right? Recently, they've had some mm -hmm. issues with Alameda County. You're, you're sort of looking for the place that will be favorable to your business. So on that side, it's like, well, and I always say this, people, there's this tendency in American media and the propaganda is to paint someone else as the enemy. Russia, China, Japan's imports. You talked about Japan earlier, Korean imports, whatever. There's always some country that's not trading fairly. There's some company that's a country that's a threat. Like, no, the biggest threat to the American people is Washington, D.C., and to some extent, our state and local governments because I'm very libertarian and I always think government's the problem. So, mm -hmm. so, but particularly, and you kind of touched on this, I have this view, let's suppose I'm a wealthy Chinese, I'm a, a powerful Chinese bureaucrat. No matter how much power you have, no matter how rich you are, if you go outside in a Chinese city and it's filled with diesel spewing cars and diesel spewing trucks, you still have to breathe the air. Your children still have to breathe the crappy air. Your grandchildren still have to breathe the crappy air. You can filter it in your house. You can filter it in your car. But at some point, you're going outside and you got to breathe this crap. And I think the people who run China were like, we're tired of breathing this crap. We want our kids to breathe clean air. We want our grandchildren to breathe clean air. How are we going to clean this shit up? And there's one company in the world that offers mm. the best opportunity to clean the air in China. And it's Tesla. Right. You know, right. that they're going to, they're, that they're, they're, they have the best plan for delivering vehicles that don't pollute. Um, the point about the boring company, I actually think the boring company might do boring company projects in China because the Chinese mm -hmm. leadership, it's almost like, like our, <laughs> this is why it's great that Kevin's here because Kevin's a forward thinker who sees, wait, we can make our state better if we do this. Hey, that's a good idea. And the people in Washington, D.C. and Gavin Newsom in California and, you know, the vast majority of politicians just don't think that way. It doesn't break into their skulls. It's that, you know, 
it's like they're not wired that way. And the people who run China are like, well, you know, we got to live here too. And mm -hmm. we can fix this. We can make this better. If they do boring tunnels, that reduces noise pollution because the vehicle's right. traffic, you know, there's so many potential advantages. But you added to this, because I've had this story in my head, the point about reducing oil dependency, I didn't think of that. That did not occur to mm -hmm. me, that China protects itself from its, from its concerns about the flow of oil because the United States, anytime it wants, can cut off the flow of oil from the Persian Gulf. They can make it hard for China to get oil. If they shift to EVs, if they shift to electric trucks, if they shift to solar power, which may be a reason why China's gone all in on solar, right? Because China's producing solar is the best place for producing solar cells. And why they're producing lithium iron phosphate batteries like crazy is because that's all part of it. They reduce their oil dependence. And I just hadn't thought of that. So I, I yeah. thank you for that. That is brilliant. You're welcome. Um, huge, huge uh, important stuff. Am I missing? Did I miss anything from that? Did I did I not characterize your your explanation correctly? No, you characterized it, it correctly. Um, I add in one of the point just about their energy thing is that um, uh, China um, now produces more energy, electricity, whatever than uh, Europe and the United States combined, and they are, you know still only one quarter per capita rich in the United States, and so they're gonna triple. The amount of energy they need. So the reason that they're building, um, you know, so much th solar, et cetera, that one they wanted to dominate the solar industry, all the the gigafactories, solar in in China, the vast majority. But they need to m make a lot more energy. They and so they and if they do less coal, which would make one plant or which plant per per week, you know, they they have to do it with, you know, nuclear and and so on and stuff. They did it with hydro for a while to get to like 10% or something like that. But that was, they have dammed every river. Every dammable river, they, they dammed it. You know, they made a three gorges equivalent to every two years. And, but they was also a strategy of that too, is that they dammed the rivers, it made them deeper so you could send 10,000 ton barges down them. And, and barges are, you know, ships is uh, more efficient than, than uh, rail, et cetera. So it was um, a massive, um, plan to allow them to develop the interior so they have this kind of like broad engineering thinking around how they do their planning so thus the fact that they want to get electric semi trucks is one of the huge bigger factors and want to improve logistics that is part of their whole thinking of like we want to do it we want to do it faster if it takes this company to do it then that's the company we'll go with we can still support our own companies we'll, we'll give them a billion dollars two billion dollars whatever but it doesn't have to be them. Yeah, so long the problem gets fixed in this broader re-engineering of cities and the whole nation, et cetera. Cool. Okay. So there's also, and I had never seen this criticism before, that China-Taiwan problems affect Tesla. Does Tesla sell? I mean, I guess they'd use TSMC for chips. But does Tesla have that it, much? It just the, it just that the, if... if China goes after Taiwan that, you know, if if that gets into some kind of like um, violent conflict or something like that, um, and they did, you know, go into Hong Kong fairly violently, um, then that could mess up relations and then that could cause some kind of uh, risk. Well, let's, let's talk about this for a second because you mentioned this a little bit. China has a quarter of the income per capita, but it also has more than four times the population. So mm -hmm. I, I've been saying this for a while. I, I, didn't, I didn't quite grasp it until I would say in the last six months or so. I think China's economy is already bigger than the U.S. economy. And it depends how you measure it. But there's... A, there's yeah, pushing power parity it is, yeah. Well, for sure. so I was looking at the market for Tesla Semi and I was really focused on the United States because I'm an American and I'm very American-centric. And I, do, I, I, I lived in Japan, I've traveled in Europe, I've been to South Korea, I've been, you know, I've been to the Caribbean, I've seen some of the world, and I speak Japanese, Spanish, and French, so I'm not as, so, as stuck on America as some others, but I still had this vestigial notion that America was the largest economy in the world. So I really just thought about Tesla Semi in terms of the United States market. And one day I was like, gee, I wonder how many semis they buy in China in a year. 
So the U for those who don't know, the U.S. market and U.S. Canada market together, I think for semi is about two hundred fifty thousand vehicles a year. Not Tesla semi for all Class Eight work trucks, the the tractor trailers that we see pulling the big the big trailers. About two hundred fifty thousand a year that are purchased in the U.S. and Canada. And I was like, I wonder how many they buy in China, and I'm figuring it's going to be a hundred thousand or you know one hundred fifty thousand or something. It's like a million. The, the market mm -hmm. for for the semis is a, is four times the size of the U.S. market for semi. And India, which has a much smaller economy, is like half a million. Like India's market mm -hmm. for semi is bigger than the U.S. market for semi. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that China actually has higher grade semis than India. Mm -hmm. But really, really striking that it makes a lot of sense for Tesla to build a semi. And and. The lithium iron phosphate cells are not good for semi. The lithium iron mm -hmm. phosphate cells that are very common in China. So it makes it would make sense for Tesla to build a 4680 cell factory. Because we haven't heard anything about 4680 cells for China yet. So mm -hmm. it would really make sense for Tesla to build 4680 cell production and semi in China. I don't know about Cybertruck. I don't know if that is something that would fit in the Chinese market. But semi could be huge in China. And so just that point that it's like if you were Elon Musk running Tesla and you were thinking, okay, we got to choose between the China and the U.S. All right, we'll stick with China because China's a bigger economy. It's a bigger market. And frankly, they treat us better than the United States does. Right? I mean, uh, I, I don't, I, if there is a problem between with U.S. foreign relations with China, I would almost think, I've actually thought that Tesla would spin off China as a separate company. Tesla China. Tesla Europe would be a spinoff as a separate company. Tesla Energy could be spun off as a separate company. And that would, to some extent, insulate them from political risk. If that part of the company is over there, that part of the company is over there, they could, to some extent, protect themselves. What do you think about that idea? Spinning off Tesla China as a separate company. Would it, you know, with Elon still a majority uh, shareholder or a, large, a significant a controlling right. shareholder? Um, I think it's possible if, um, you know, Depending upon you know, the, the, the political risk, you know, they they decide that something that, that's a thing. Um, I'm not sure of any other major companies. You know, like Apple still one piece, Google still one piece, um, Amazon still one piece. So, um, splitting into subsidiaries or you know, into completely separate companies, I haven't seen it happen in a, in a big way. Other than you know, when you, you split AT and T, where it was forced, um, but I haven't seen one where they did it. Um, nationally, um, maybe Standard Oil did it. I, I can't remember if, if that happened with them. Okay, yeah. so one of the other negatives: Elon losing focus. Elon crazy tweets. I think you and I both agree those are short-term impacts. That's not really yeah. going to be a problem. SEC trouble. Okay, they pay another fifty million dollar fine at some point. No, you know, they paid a twenty million dollar fine. They could pay a fifty million dollar fine. No big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Tesla Bitcoin. I don't understand why people made such a big deal about Bitcoin. The company is worth mm -hmm. 600, 700 billion dollars. They spent, mm -hmm. they bought 1.5 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. They didn't even hold it all. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it? 0.2 percent of the company's market cap. Who cares? Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Why was this? Yeah. And then Gary Gary Black makes a big deal about it. Like, who cares? This is you know, mm -hmm. they're they're trying something out. Hey, they're aggressive. Because I think there's enough um, enough um, catalysts and news and stuff like that. Like if they, you know, do the thing where they get the FSD out, where they get complete the Berlin factory, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, this stuff all goes away. It's also it's just because things were weak for a while, so it's kind of like you know, it's a thing to be be worried about. It's something that has um, you know so much um, you know pro and anti crypto people that it just it just you know, triggers people. Okay. So we covered the negatives, the Tesla Q story. You had in your PowerPoint, I'm going to show this to the audience. I don't think you guys will be able to see this, but, or read this, but um, this is from Matty Mogul. Um, it's Matt Joyce. He, I, I'm hoping to interview Matt Joyce in a week or two. I forget when. I don't think we picked the date yet. Um, but it's Matty Mogul, Matty underscore Mogul on Twitter. He does this uh, electric vehicle core efficiency rating where he looks at vehicles and he sees how efficient they are. And it's a combination of the battery pack 
in kilowatt hours, the, the EPA rated range, the weight of the vehicle, and then he divides them together to come up with a core efficiency number. And Teslas crush it. Teslas are much more efficient. That, so the, the Teslas come up with a core efficiency number of between 5 and 5.3, depending on which vehicle. The nearest competitor in battery efficient core efficiency is the Hyundai Ionic, which I think is before the Ionic 5 at 6.6. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to relate this back to the Ford F-150 Lightning for a second. So did you see the MKBHD? Marcus Brownlee did a video about the Ford F-150 Lightning. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that I, I criticized him on Twitter. I was surprised he responded. Um, he was talking about it like, oh, this thing's really going to get 450 miles of range with 1,000 pounds in the bed. Like, the core efficiency would be insane. And, you know, the, the F-150 has the aerodynamics of a flying brick, right? You know, mm -hmm. all the vehicles on this list, on Matty Mogul's list that you have, there's no pickup truck. Well, there's the Rivians. The Rivians are on the list. They're sort of pickup trucks, but I think they're more aerodynamic than a Ford F-150. The Ford F-150, in addition to being probably a poor coefficient of drag, it's also got a really big frontal area, right? I think the Rivian mm -hmm. is a little bit smaller in terms of frontal area, maybe a little shorter in height. The, the F-150 is also taller. It's like four inches taller than the Cybertruck. Um, so it's like mm -hmm. this brick flying through the air. You're going to have terrible efficiency. The Rivians are weighing in under 6,000 pounds, and they're getting mm -hmm. you know, 300 miles of range with 135 kilowatt hour packs. And the, mm -hmm. the F-150 Lightning is going to be a minimum of 6,500 pounds. So that's 700 more pounds. I don't see how they're going to get anywhere near the right. I, I felt like Marcus Brownlee just got punked by Ford to come up with those mm -hmm. numbers. Like yeah. you add a thousand pounds of payload, you know, there's no way your, your efficiency, right. you know, are, they're not going to, I don't think Ford is going to be as efficient as Rivian because Rivian's well, I mean, Rivian is still like speculative anyway. They haven't really come out with a vehicle yet. Um, I think the mm -hmm. Rivian numbers might be overly optimistic. So, you're probably looking at a core efficiency rating for the core efficiency number for the F-150 Lightning over eight. Does that make any sense right. to you? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Also, it's because um, it's not just the the you know aerodynamics of things. The efficiency is mainly coming from the electronics and the computer control of the uh, of the whole drivetrain and stuff like that. So it's you know people kept saying, oh. It's, so easy to copy what Tesla's done, but it's like their electronics and the computers are are far better, and also some other components. You know, they're they have some um, uh, magnet that's uh, that's leveraging um, some other physical effects in order to, to double the intensity of the magnet, get more efficiency out of it. So they do a lot of stuff to to make things more efficient, um, their HVAC more efficient, etc. Right. So they do a. Well, but, he, you know, not but, just, but hey, I'm not comparing him to Tesla. I'm just saying, like, compare him to the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which is on Maddie's chart, and it's got a core yeah. efficiency rating of seven. Well, the Mustang yeah. Mach-E is an aerodynamic vehicle, right? Right. And, right. Um, you know, the aerodynamics of the Mustang Mach-E are way better than the F-150 Lightning. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I just don't see it. I don't see how they're going to get there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the Ford... F 150 probably come in like eight or nine. I think you probably can do the calculation, even though they haven't built it, just based on um, kilowatt hour of the pack, um, range, and um, yeah, I think you can just kilowatt hour of the pack and range, you can probably get the core efficiency out of the whole thing. Okay. I, I just don't so, see, yeah, I, I don't see the them target. getting there. So let's talk about debt. Mm -hmm. Toyota's long term debt, you have this is a, uh, another page you had for me. Toyota's long-term debt, $185 billion US. They have $83 billion in cash, and they make money. Volkswagen has $200 billion in debt, $62 billion in cash, and they make money. They make less than Toyota, but they make money. Ford yep. has $160 billion in debt, $46 billion in cash, and they're losing money. Right? Yep. GM, $100 billion in cash, plus a $14 billion unpaid bailout loan, $29 billion in cash. Hundred hundred billion dollars in debt, plus a fourteen yeah. billion dollar unpaid bailout loan. Twenty nine billion dollars in cash, nine billion dollars. So for, so GM made money last year. Daimler has one hundred six yeah. billion dollars in long term debt. BMW has one hundred twenty seven billion dollars in long term debt. 
Tesla has $9 billion in long-term debt and they have more cash than they have debt. Everybody else has got a lot more debt than cash. Tesla has more cash mm -hmm. than debt. So what does that do for Tesla in terms of success in the marketplace versus these other companies? Well, they don't have the, the, the loan payments on it to drag them down. Um, if they, they hit a bump, then, you know, you loan the stuff to pay. And then, you know, it, it also lets them, you know, if they want to accelerate with any debt financing, they have plenty of room to do it. Especially, you know, if they get up to, you know, 2 million cars per year and, and start making $5 billion per quarter, then, you know, then that would mean that they could, you know, massively accelerate. If they had the need to invest $50 billion, they could easily support that level of, of um, you know, you know, whether they do it with if their stock price times, they do it that way, but you give them a lot more flexibility. And also it goes also to the question of when people say, oh, you know, Toyota is only worth $220 billion. Well, if they had Tesla debt level, they'd be $360 billion, right? So they're, they're, these other companies would be more valuable if they didn't have so much massive amounts of debt. You know, you know, Volkswagen wouldn't be an $80 billion company. They'd be a $280 billion company if they didn't have $200 billion worth of debt. Okay. So, it, yeah. So I want to ask you something about this, but before we go on, um, how are you doing on time? Because we've been going for two hours and 20 minutes. Are you okay? Um, maybe we can try and wrap up in 10, I guess. Okay. Maybe. So on yeah. this debt thing, I'm looking at these companies with all this debt. And yeah. I have this theory. Tesla currently sold half a million cars so it's in 20, 2020. So that's not really a big impact on Volkswagen selling 10 million cars, Toyota selling 10 million cars. They're not really taking that much of the market from other car companies yet. Mm. Tesla expands to selling 5 million cars. And let's say there's 70 million cars sold in a year. Well, now they're taking... 10% of the market. And some of these companies are losing market share. And my theory is the premise that these companies are operating under is we're making money that will enable us to pay off this debt over the long, or it enables us to pay the interest on the debt and pay off the debt over the long haul. They may not actually pay off the debt, but in mm -hmm. theory, they, they're earning income so they can pay the debt. Right. If Tesla takes market share from internal combustion engine vehicle makers like Toyota, Volkswagen, Ford, GM, Daimler, BMW, their story starts to fall apart, right? It, you know, right. I think their profits, when they make profits, are premised on selling as many cars as you sold last year or more. They need some yeah. level of growth in order to sustain profitability. If they start shrinking, it really, you know, if you built the factory already and you were counting on that factory, you know, making money on, you know, 500,000 cars and all of a sudden you only made money on 400,000 cars, your, your story starts to explode. So do you see out of the list of car makers, one company that's at the greatest risk of collapsing? Is it Ford? Because they have a lot of debt and they're losing money. Yeah, I, I think um, Ford and GM Ford is definitely the weakest, um, but um, GM is not that much stronger. And then um, I think and I see them. But doesn't doesn't Tesla seem to take sales? I mean, the, the space that they operate in now with the Model Three, Model Y, the Model BMW, yeah, they're, they're the in the. I mean, I, the um, path of Tesla. I mean, I feel like BMW is at most at risk. They have the, they have more debt than Daimler. I, mean, I don't know who's a bigger company overall, but you know, the Model Three is a direct competitor with the BMW 3 Series. Right, and so it's selling them now. Yeah. And then so, I have yeah. this image of Tesla ramping up Model S, building another Model S factory. This is assuming we don't go robo-taxi, which changes everything. Tesla ramps up the Model S, and they produce a lithium iron phosphate version with a structural battery pack, and they sell it for 60 grand, and it starts competing with the BMW 5 Series. And then the higher-end version competes with the BMW 7 Series. And it competes with the Mercedes E-Class and the Mercedes uh, S-Class. At a certain point, how do those companies survive? Yeah, I, I think that the, the more likely scenario is that they don't. I think that they, especially if, if Tesla gets into all, you know, with Cybertruck and Cyber SUV, where they have no place left to hide, 
and they, with the the compact car it kept testing properly, then yeah, a lot of these companies uh, collapse. Oh, cy- if, if cyber trucks a hit and they make a cyber SUV, that just destroys everyone. I mean, right? If, if, if I think cyber trucks going to be a huge hit, um, yeah, and you know that that wrecks Ford and GM in particular. Yeah. So then then they need a national bailout and they need um a um um. To to get Tesla, Tesla's got four basic batteries, and, and um, it's half the cost of batteries. Then they have to say, okay, we bend the knee to you. We are do, only doing marketing. We're buying your vehicles and stuff. And we're just doing this pass through thing. And by the way, we had to get a, a bailout from the government. But to okay, so that debt. I don't think that works. I'm going to tell you why I think that doesn't work. If you get a bailout, the bailout is going to be premised on you keep all these employees. Right. Right. The government isn't going to bail you out and then let you fire everybody. Right. So the employees have to do something and they probably have to make cars. I think I, I, I definitely see this coming that um, they maybe it's BMW first. Maybe it's Ford. you know, if, if Cybertruck is a success and it wrecks the F-150, that's that's tough for Ford because that's where they make their money. And same thing with GM. But when the government bails them out, the bailout comes with more strings. Mm-hmm. It makes it hard. It's not like I mean. It frees them of the debt burden, but they still don't have the ability to make cars efficiently. And they can't just right. build Teslas because they they don't have the flexibility to adopt Tesla's manufacturing system and the unions won't go for it. And there's a bailout that comes from Joe Biden. It's going to be union friendly, right? So it's mm-hmm. it's just, and it's going to be dealership friendly because dealers have so much political power. So the <laughs> the there's so many things that are hamstringing the uh, the current car companies that they don't really need a bailout they need to be freed of the burden of unions and the burden of dealerships and the burden of all this all these stakeholder claims making it hard for them to do business efficiently and the burden of having executives who have no clue how to who aren't engineers right who who don't have an engineering mindset and i just i don't see any way you could bail them out you could clear gm's long-term debt of 100 billion dollars they'd still they still wouldn't be able to compete and then you go to the robo taxi world. Like, suppose they actually deliver robo taxis, and Tesla starts pumping out vehicles that charge a dollar a mile, and you know, people decide as a large chunk of people decide, I'm not going to bother owning a car anymore. I'm just going to ride in a robo taxi. And all of a sudden, vehicle sales plummet from 70 million vehicles a year to 50 million vehicles a year. And Tesla's <laughs> selling five million vehicles a year out of that, or 10 million vehicles a year out of that. Um, there's just not a lot left for the for the car companies. I, I genuinely yeah, so, think I, I think they're gonna get bailed out and they're gonna fail again. Probably, yeah. They'll get failed again. And and if they get to, like you said, the, the 20 million cars, the 20 million cars, you know, people were thinking, oh, because Toyota and Volkswagen topped out at 10 million each or something like that, that, that would be the, the largest car company you could get only with 10%. Right. That Tesla doesn't have to follow those rules. If, if Tesla is, you know, has half of the cars, all the EV cars, you know, the the percentage left for the others may not be that much, you know. And it, it, yeah. Okay. All right. So I think we covered everything on your PowerPoint. Let me just see if there's any questions from the audience. Here's a question. How come Model 3 is not called a, a BMW killer? What do you think of that? Yeah. Or is, that just, is that just a snarky comment? Oh, do you think... That the cyber truck would work as a work truck. Do you know much about pickups? Um, I'm I've ordered cyber trucks. Me too. Um, I, it'd, be, it'd be the first uh, truck I'll, I'll have. Um, and uh, but you know it has the charging stuff. It has a lot of features that um, you know you know the towing capacity and space as well as um, you know able to run equipment off it. You know I'm looking forward to you know being able to you know you can sleep in the back of it as like a mini. Um, a Winnebago kind of thing, you know. It's like a here's a question. Can tour around in pearl comfort. Here's a question for you, Giovanni says, "Why doesn't Tesla just pay off a huge chunk of that debt?" I think they did pay off some debt, didn't they? I think they did pay off some debt. Yeah. I think Q1 they announced yeah. they paid off some debt. I mean, I think there's a also I think they have a really good rate on it, so they don't think they need to. It's like you know, why burn your cash if they're just sitting there not hurting you? Right. You Isn't know, there you, a theory you know, that there's there's some theory about that there's some value in having some debt 
that you know yeah yeah give you i think more leverage and, and stuff like that is like good to, leverage yeah. debt equity ratio so the same reason some people buy stock on margin right because you can invest that money in your yeah. business and if the business is growing faster than your interest payments then you're doing great and it's a good decision yeah. um let's see i don't seven foot tall cyber suv sounds good to me low SUV, low center of gravity too I'm not sure why the cyber SUV would be seven feet tall. Um, all right, I'm not seeing a lot of questions so far, although I didn't, maybe I didn't give them enough time. Um, how do you feel about, do you think the government should bail out the car, the governments, U.S. government, German government? Do you think the, the country's government should be bailing out car makers? Um, I don't believe in the bailouts. I just think that politically it will happen soon. Is there a way we could? Your mic just died. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I think um, can you hear me now. Yes. My my um, buds ran out of battery. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. All right. So I don't see any more. Oh, do you have a an estimate of the worldwide demand for Cybertruck? Like, do you think they could sell a million? Like, they're planning to spell 250,000 to 300,000 a year. Do you think they're sandbagging and they could really sell a million a year? Um, I think they could sell a million a year, in particular with the, um, 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 if they get the robo version of it, you know, robo taxi version of it working. Yeah. Okay. I mean, actually, let me, let me go right into that. Do you, do you need to go? Yeah. yeah, I think I need to go. Okay, so listen, uh, Brian Wong, thank you very much. It's, uh, tell me the name of the website again, nextbigfuture.com? Yes. And it's Next Big Future on Twitter as well, right? Is the, the Twitter yeah, handle. Yeah, Twitter. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go and I'm going to stay on. Okay. Um, so if people have questions that I, I have time to answer questions. So Brian, thank you very much. Maybe we'll do thank this you. again sometime. Yep, and I, I'm going to switch to my regular look. So, and Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye. Okay. We're, he, he just hung up on me. Good. I think he had something come up. So, uh, let's see. Dragos asks, Hey, Warren, where the, where will the compact Tesla likely be manufactured? Do they need to build new giga plants for those? Yes. They need to build new giga factories for the, um, compact vehicle. My prediction is that they will build one in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> they will build one in China, probably Shanghai, but not necessarily Shanghai. Um, I think China may be incentivizing them to incentivizing EV makers to build them in other places. So Neo is building its some of its EVs in a new place called or uh, planning to build new vehicles in a place called Neo Park, NEO Park. Maybe Tesla will be invited to build there too. Um, and then I think one in Europe. I think they might build one in Japan. I, I don't know if you saw the tweet that Elon is planning to go to Japan. I think. Panasonic being based in Osaka, Japan, <clears throat> building a, te a Panasonic Terra factory for batteries alongside a Tesla Giga factory for the compact would make a lot of sense. Japan is the fourth largest car market in the world. So I think three or four next generation Giga factories, one in Texas, one in it, it could be like the Carolinas, but I think Texas makes more sense. Um, so Texas, Europe, China, Japan. That's if they if they're able to do three or four million vehicles a year out of each giga factory. If they can only do two million vehicles a year out of each giga factory, then I could see a couple more, one in the UK, maybe one in like Thailand or India. Um also I think they're gonna build cyber van, some kind of van minibus type vehicle that I could see them building that in uh Chennai, India, maybe. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, thank you, not financial advice for your support. Um and while we're talking. T-shirts, uh, the stainless steel mug, uh, elonbits.com. While we're talking, my, my book, Fair DUI, is on Amazon. Links to all that are in the description below. And of course, please support this channel on Patreon. Uh, there's my Patreon. There we go. So um, how about Tesla solar farms delivering mega packs to large electricity users and disintermediating intermediating electric utility companies all wires outside the building so i definitely think we could see tesla solar farms although i don't 
I haven't seen any indication of solar farms. I could see mega pack farms. I, I don't, it does, it's not crazy for Tesla to do solar pack, solar farms as well. Um, I think there's a lot of potential cut, which, you know, it's funny when we were doing this video earlier, I made a list of like potential, and I'm interested in hearing from, from people more, potential customers for mega pack. We got office buildings. We got big stores like Walmarts and Targets. Um, we've, and maybe shopping malls. We've got apartment complexes, we've got hotels, we've got college campuses, large schools. I mean, my, my kid goes to school, there's, there's high schools with 4,000 students plus all the teachers. A lot of potential in a lot of those places. And then, yeah, I, I, mean, I think we're going to see solar farms soon and we're going to see wind farms soon and any solar farm or wind farm is gonna have mega packs. Um, did I buy any AMC? I have no interest in AMC. That's not something that motivates me. I'm not, I'm not a stock market trader. How many mega packs would fit in a 53 foot trailer? I think one at best. I think mega packs are really, really heavy. Three megawatt hours at, at a hundred, that's like 200 watt hours per kilogram. I, th I think a mega pack would be too heavy to be putting on a trailer. I mean, to be putting on a trailer that you drive around. Um, very, very heavy. Um, John Irwin says he thinks that the Texas Gigaplants will just keep expanding and expanding Model S and X independent factory on the same site. Uh, I was thinking they would build a Model S and X factory in Europe or maybe a Model S and X factory in China. Um, if the demand is high, if they're able to get the cost of those vehicles down, it could make a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense if we go to a robo-taxi world, but it makes sense otherwise. Um, what do I think about Tesla using power walls to mine to, for Bitcoin mining? I, I think that I see Tesla using the vehicles, the, especially with they just added this new chip to the Model S and X that's got like the, basically the PlayStation 5 with like 10 teraflops. That could, be a, that could be a crypto mining solution. I've thought that they should develop their own cryptocurrency that's based on matrix.product math, not product... Uh, the math that the chips do and that the FSD chips do, because that's a supercomputer. <laughs> red SJO says, will I change the big red arrow to a big green arrow? That's a pretty good idea. I should probably do that. Um, wind farms with base tower made from structural 4680 batteries. No, wind farms will, well, wind farms will use nickel based, uh, iron based chemistries, not, uh, which could still be 4680, but I don't think wind farms need structural Battery pack. It's funny, I was having a conversation today. What about making single piece casting bicycles and maybe doing that with a structural, like electric bicycles with a battery, structural battery uh, built into the bike frame? That'd be interesting. Um, Jack Jerker says, looking at your book, Fair DUI on Amazon, that's a nice picture, Warren. Um, this is my wife's hand. Uh, the idea is that it's handcuffs with a glass of wine and a car door. Uh, it's a really good book. Don't you, I, I think, Jack, you can see that it's got good ratings from, from readers. And the negative ratings are mostly from, like, Mothers Against Drunk Driving people who hate the idea. I mean, if you actually read the book, the first, I think it's the second, the first advice in the book is don't drink and drive. <laughs> so um, there are already hundreds of electric car companies in China. Yeah, there's 100 electric car companies in China, but that doesn't mean they're successful. Should Tesla buy and scrap oil refineries? No, I don't see why they would do that. Is anyone here involved with work on solar in Ontario, Canada? I have no idea about that. Um, any guess on how much it will be for a Cybertruck solar panel option? Good question, David. Uh, I'm going to guess it's at least a couple thousand dollars. I mean, uh, uh, I think the biggest question about the Cybertruck solar panel option, for those who don't know, there's this idea that on the the back cover of this of the bed on the Cybertruck, there's going to be a, there might be an option to put solar on the bed so that you can generate electricity. It's not going to generate much electricity. Okay, it's not like you're going to generate a hundred miles in a day. You're going to generate ten miles or fifteen miles in a day. Um, a regular panel would cost, you know, a couple hundred bucks, but something that's designed to go into that cover. You know, I think they got to figure out how many people are going to buy those, whether it's worth actually doing. I would guess it's at least two grand and maybe five grand for that. And I, I wouldn't, I don't know that it makes sense to buy it. I, Elon also talked about like a fold out one that you would carry in the truck and fold it out to Jen. 
that would probably make a lot more sense than something integrated in the, the bed cover. But what do I know? Um, what about gambling? I don't know what gambling has to do with anything. Do I think with Biden's EV tax credit in the pipeline, Tesla should accelerate production? I think Tesla is accelerating production as much as they can. I don't think it's like they're they're not trying to accelerate. They're trying to accelerate production as much as they can already. So I don't I don't think that's an issue. Um, if Ford is the number one truck, wouldn't all pickups be in trouble? Yes, yes, all pickups. GM pickups are in trouble. Do, uh, Dodge pickups are in trouble. Toyota. They call it Ram pickups. Um, Toyota pickups are in trouble. Uh, Mark Plot is mentioning all set homes. Mark, I, I don't know if you keep bringing that up or other people. Be, all set homes, to my knowledge, has not built a home yet. <laughs> when they build a home, we can talk. Thank you, Tactical Tesla, for your support. Um, I saw one of your videos where you were arrested by cops a few years ago. Can you tell us what would happen? That's related to the book Fair DUI. I am a critic of DUI checkpoints. I challenged a DUI checkpoint in Miami, Florida. I was, quote, arrested, and then I was unarrested three hours later after sitting in a very uncomfortable backseat of a police car. Um, they did prosecute me. The charge was dismissed. They, uh, they fought it. There was an, they appealed. I won the appeal. I won on a technicality, not on a, the substance of the issue. Um, but basically, I refused to roll down my window and I held up a flyer that says I remain silent, no searches, I want my lawyer. If you go to fairdui.org, you can see all this. And if you look at videos earlier in my channel, if you search for DUI on my channel videos, you'll see some of what I say about drunk driving. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, for those who don't know. Mostly retired. Gambling and boring company tunnels in Vegas. So um, let's talk about this for a second. Tesla robo taxis in general, whether they're in boring company tunnels, whether they're robo taxis, I could see vending machines where you can buy a Coke, you can buy a cup of coffee, or you can buy a, a granola bar. You know, you're probably not going to want to sell pizza in the robo taxi, although I wouldn't rule it out. Um, but I think there's a lot of ways that they could make additional money, incremental money from a robo taxi environment, whether it's in a boring company tunnel or it's a, a genuine robo taxi. Tyler asks, when will Tesla announce the next factory? I think it's, um, if you watched Elon's interview with Sandy Monroe, Elon did not want to get into that yet. I think he want, he said he wanted to see Berlin and Texas start the ramp and make some progress ramping production. And once they feel like they're making progress on Berlin and the Texas gigafactories, then they'll be ready to start moving forward with the next generation gigafactory. So I would say they will announce the next generation factories in mid-2022. Rob Markovich says, Warren, Elon said energy is going to be just as big as auto. Why didn't you reflect that in your model posted today? I think I did, Rob. I think if you look at the model, um, and Patreon supporters have access to the spreadsheets, but I think if you look at the model, Megapack was a really, really large source of revenue and profit. Um, Powerwall and solar, I... I don't see Powerwall and solar scaling that much. It's hard for me to see how they scale as much as they should, as much as I'd like them to. But Megapack, I think, is going to be a monster uh, revenue and profit machine for Tesla. And it is in the model. It's not. That's 2026, by the way. So maybe by 2030, it scales more. Uh, Aviv asks, thoughts on the Q2 earnings call? It's too early to talk about that. I don't. I think that the the Q2 question is how many vehicles will they deliver in Q2? So they delivered 184,000, I think, in Q1. So if they deliver 200,000, that's my my ballpark estimate for vehicle deliveries in Q2 is around 200 to 210. But the news out of China has been really positive. So I suppose it's possible that they deliver. Um, I think it's possible they deliver more like 250,000 vehicles. In quarter two, if they deliver more than 220,000 vehicles in 2022, that's a really, really good sign. Homer Cut says he would totally get the solar roll up cover. He's getting the single motor uh, vehicle and make a huge difference. It's not going to, that's the problem. It's not going to make a huge difference. It's, if you look at how much electricity, how much energy a solar panel can produce, like a, like a four by eight, roughly three by six or four by eight panel like a highly optimized panel might produce three kilowatt hours over the course of a day. You're going to have a hundred kilowatt hour pack in your car, in your maybe an 80 kilowatt hour pack. 
but that's a highly optimized one to in integrate it into the bed cover it's probably not going to be as efficient as a regular solar panel so you're losing something there so i think at best you're going to get two kilowatt hours a day out of that solar panel and that's just not enough to move the needle it's not going to make sense i mean you might as well buy a dual motor <laughs> if you want you're going to get more range by, I wonder, I wonder if there will be an extra cost option to just add more battery pack, more battery, more range. That would make some sense to me. Damien says, how about the mega packs are charged at Tesla solar farms and delivered to customers by Tesla semi trucks with extra. No, I, I think in terms of delivering a mega pack, I'm sure that they're able to deliver them on a truck one way or the other. I don't know exactly what's involved in that. You know, maybe you have to have an overweight truck and you have to have special permits to do it. Um, maybe they're, maybe, I, I don't know whether they weigh, they have to weigh like 40,000 pounds to start being a problem for a truck. I don't, I don't, I'd have, I'd have to do some math to figure out, all right, if it's 200 watt hours per, let's say it's 150 watt hours per kilogram or 200 watt hours per kilogram at three megawatt hours, 3000 kilowatt hours, 30 a lot of kilograms 3000 mega 3 3000 times 30 I, I don't know it's it's all it's really heavy 100 watt hours per oh what's 100 watt hours so 10 kilograms for a kilowatt hour times 3000 so it's 30000 pounds i get that right i think they weigh 30000 pounds so you could fit one on a you could fit one on the back of a, a trailer. I thought you were suggesting people would drive around with a mega pack to carry ex to give them extra extra range, which might make sense, but not really. Um, let's see. Royce asks, "I bought a Model Y this weekend. Every time I drove by, they were constantly delivering Model Ys. Do you think there will be a blowout? I don't know what you mean by a blowout." Uh, any updates on the $25,000 car? No. Um, will GM and Ford build plug-in hybrids or EVs under Biden incentive plan? I think they're only planning to build EVs, but I don't know. I think Ford does build a plug-in hybrid now. My friend of mine has one. Is Megapack a continuous revenue source? So um, I think there's two ways of looking at Megapack. One is that you're just selling it to someone as a customer, I believe the way that they sell them, I believe there is a servicing arrangement where they probably get paid for servicing the mega pack along the way. So there's some revenue from um, service of the mega pack or maybe for software licensing. Um, the other theory is that they make contracts with customers where they're going to deploy mega pack and manage it and they're going to make money on it some other way. I, I don't know enough about that. I haven't I did talk to somebody in a video about that. And there is this theory that they're going to make money from arbitraging, um, using auto bidder and things like that. Well, I think Tesla might let owners use auto bidders and auto bidder in cases where people don't own all Tesla products, say Tesla vehicle owners with battery and solar bought from elsewhere. I don't think auto bidder makes sense with that. I think you might be talking about some other software. Auto bidder, I think is primarily for mega pack and that doesn't really fit. Um, I, as far as I know, they're not using auto bidder for Powerwall, but I could be wrong about that. Elliot Safar, you mean the actual? Oh, say so Zach and Jesse once talked about dragging around a mega pack just to go coast to coast without recharging. Yet in the World Book of Records, never followed up. Well, it would be a million dollars for a mega pack. I don't think I know Zach and Jesse have done really well on YouTube, but I don't think they want to spend a million dollars on a mega pack. Um, Mark, I I thought I read. I thought they said that they weren't making money on Mega Pack yet, that they're making money on Powerwall, but they're not making money on Mega Pack yet. I think the hurdle with Mega Pack is that they need to ramp up production and they don't have enough cells to ramp up production. And when they're ready to, when they have enough cells and they can ramp up production, they'll get a lot more efficient in making Mega Pack. Dragos asks, hey, Warren, how big do you think the battery on the compact will be? I think it'll be 40 kilowatt hour pack. Um, I think Tesla will design it to be hyper efficient with structural battery packs, single piece castings and all that. And I think that it will, um, so if it gets a Matty Joyce's core efficiency rating of eight, if it gets eight miles per kilowatt hour, 
then a 40 kilowatt hour pack would have 320 miles of range. I think if they get the efficiency that they're shooting for on this vehicle, then 40 kilowatt hour pack would get 320 miles of range. And that would be plenty for robo taxi use. Even at 7.5 miles per kilowatt hour, 40 kilowatt hour pack would get you to 300 mile range, I believe. About the semi, do I think they will divide the one megawatt into four segments and the charging cable and have four different 350 kilowatt charge cables? So it takes around 42 minutes to charge it. Does this make sense? No, it actually does. It doesn't work that way. It turns out that however big your battery is, it takes the same length of time to charge. It's not like having four smaller batteries charges faster. It's counterintuitive. I understand why you would think that way, but there's this concept called charge rate and the battery charges based on the percentage of the capacity, not on the percentage of, not on the amount of juice you got to put in. So I don't think it will work that way. I think it's possible that they'll split it up for other reasons, but it's not about the battery chemistry, at least, that they need to do it that way. Google says Tesla Mega Pack weighs 51,000 pounds. Shemai trailers haul 48,000 pounds. I imagine if you had a trailer that didn't have a cover, yeah, I, that's tricky. Google says Tesla Mega Pack weighs. So maybe they can make a Mega Pack get down to 48,000 pounds. I don't know. But Semi, I think Semi has a slightly slow, smaller payload than diesel pickups, diesel trucks, because of the extra weight of the battery pack in the Semi. So. I almost wonder if you could do it with like power packs instead of mega pack, you know, put, put two power packs in there and no, I think that wouldn't be that much. So three megawatt hours. I don't know if three megawatt hours is enough to get them across the country anyway. Will you really be able to play the Witcher in your cyber truck? I don't even know what the Witcher is. Um, Rob Markovich says, Warren, I listened to the Jay Leno clip, sick. For those who missed that, Jay Leno was on a podcast or radio show and said that he drove the Plaid Model S on a drag strip in Bakersfield, California. And he did a quarter mile in 9.27 seconds or something like that, which apparently is really fast. And I think he, they, at the quarter mile, he was going 152 or 162 miles an hour, which is like, Zero, you know, we usually think about zero to 60 in, you know, eight seconds would be like in the good old days, zero to 60 in eight seconds wouldn't be that bad for a decent car. And this was zero to 160 in nine seconds. Like insane. Halak says, what is expected from the June 10th event? What's expected is they're going to deliver Model S to vehicles and they're going to probably explain what's special about the new Model S and Model X. And then there might be one more thing. Maybe they'll announce that FSD version 9 has been released. Maybe they'll talk about uh, 40, progress on 4680 cell. It might have some surprise. Maybe Roadster will be start delivering too. I don't know. Um, maybe Semi will start delivering. Cybertruck so prototype was being charged by plugging into four different superchargers at the same time at night when nobody was there. Cybertruck prototype? Jim? Cybertruck prototype? That doesn't sound right. Mega Plaque plus eight superchargers on semi trailer does exist. Interesting. Tesla's deployed Mega Pack on a flat pad to supplement supercharger station. Interesting. So well, they may have a way of doing it. I don't know. Witcher is a video game that requires PS5 level hardware to play. AMD Ryzen announced yesterday this chip supplier. I just, I've never seen The Witcher, so I don't know enough about that. I know that they're planning to do really high-end video games on the te in the Model S and Model X. I don't know how many Model S and Model X users, owners care about high-end video games. Like, I, I'm, I'm like 55 years old, and I bought a PlayStation 3 for my 40th birthday, and then I never used it. I used it to watch Blu-ray <laughs> Blu discs. I wonder how many people watching know what a Blu-ray disc is. Um... Can Tesla take over lawn care tractors in the power tool industry given 4680s? Um, I think that that's a down the road thing. And I think the answer is probably there. It's going to be a long time before Tesla would focus on that sector. I don't want to say it's impossible. I just think it's unlikely. Um, Ross says plug-in hybrids can get 4,000 of 7,500 for incentives. Okay. Um, 
David Rucker says Plaid Plus and Roadster should ship with Grand Theft Auto as the game. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to go for five or ten more minutes unless I don't see any interesting questions. Sorry. Uh, let's see. I feel like I've covered all these questions. In the future, will SpaceX become a mineral mining facility in space? Um, I think that they will be doing mining on Mars and they might do mining on the moon. I think the concept of asteroid mining makes a lot of sense to some people, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I'm not saying never. I just think that it's a long way down the road before asteroid mining will make sense, but mining on Mars will be a thing and mining on the moon will probably be a thing. Uh, Red asks, why does the SX still have radar and model three not? Um, I think that they're testing out how it works. They, I don't really know the answer to that question. I think it's almost like it probably would have been too hard to redesign S and X to take the radar out. And it was easier to just stick the radar in for now. And then ultimately they're probably going to take radar out of S and X. Um, and they, they were having enough issues getting S and X out. They didn't want to create another hurdle. Um, Yes, Matt Sanko, it doesn't make sense to mine in space and bring it back to Earth. I should have said that. I should have been clear about that. It doesn't make sense to mine on the moon and bring it back to Earth. It doesn't make sense to mine on Mars or asteroids and bring it back to Earth. Pretty much anything you're going to find in the asteroid belt, or asteroids on Mars, or on the moon, it already exists on Earth, and the cost of mining that material on Earth is much less than the cost of going into space, mining it, and then bringing it back to Earth. And here's another thing. Think about this. What's the payload on Starship? 100 tons, 150 tons max? What mineral are you going to mine and get 150 tons worth pure or relatively pure and then bring back to Earth? I don't think it makes sense. Hmm. Crashing asteroids into Mars and mining them makes sense. No, it's the delta V of getting the asteroid to Mars is a, quite a hurdle. And then the, the impact of having... Maybe crashing asteroids into Mars would help warm up the Martian atmosphere. That's an interesting idea. How high do I think Tesla stock will get after the Model S Plaid event? I don't think it's going to have a significant impact on the stock. I think the stock is is mired in Wall Streetism and FUD, media FUD and Tesla Q stuff. And I think it's going to be when the 4680 start producing and, and Berlin and Texas start producing, that's really going to... I can't say. I don't know what's going to wake up Wall Street and wake up long-term investors who aren't in Tesla yet to say, holy crap, we should be in this company. But I think when Berlin and Texas start producing in volume and people start figuring out, wait a minute, these factories that they have now are going to get them to five or six million vehicles a year and they're about to build some new factories. At some point, that's going to click. And maybe when FSD works will be another thing that will click. You know, when they actually deliver FSD and it actually works and everybody goes, holy cow. And consu even Consumer Distorts says, wait, this is good. And then you start the, you know, when the first robo-taxi ride happens, that's a big, that's a, that's a big moment. But, you know, it's so hard to figure out what's going on in the minds of Wall Streeters and media FUD to, to get them to figure out, holy crap, where's this going? It's amazing. Um... Heard something about Tesla buying stamping machines from Neo who couldn't afford to take delivery. Anyone else hear that? No, I haven't heard that. Uh, let's see. The number of radarless Model S and X would take longer to have its neural network to learn from those vehicles. I don't. It's a. I don't know. It's a really good question, actually. I don't know why they're not. Why they're putting radar in S and X? Best thing I can figure is the. The hassle of redesigning SNX to take it out, redesigning the process by which they make it is too much for them to deal with. Um, all right. Well, I think Tactical Tesla says the media is protecting their advertising dollars by spreading FUD. Yeah, there's a really interesting theory that... Um, there's a lot of theories about why the media is biased against Tesla. I think the thing that will stop it is when 
enough people have Teslas or have experience in Teslas that all of a sudden it falls apart. I don't know what Bobcat plant is. I don't know what that's a reference to. So Giovanni says it only makes sense to bring high purity platinum group metals. Yeah, yeah. So the theory is you could mine asteroids for gold and platinum or palladium or whatever. And it's like, okay, what are the odds you're going to be able to find an asteroid that's like pure platinum? You're going to find an asteroid that has a whole bunch of crap on it. You're going to have to find whatever materials to try to get as much platinum as you can. And so, okay, you get 100 tons. You know, are you going to be able to get 100 tons of it? How much are you going to be able to get? That's a real, real stretch. Um, I think when you, what the mining on the moon will be for the moon, for use on the moon, the mining on Mars will be for use on Mars. And it won't make a lot of sense to mine in space to bring stuff back to Earth because the Earth has plenty of resources. There was some particular resource that was particularly valuable that you found on asteroids that was not available. Maybe they find a new mineral and, and space that we didn't have here. That would make sense. But we, any, any mineral you have in space, as far as I've seen, we have some of it here. Rob Markovich says, Project Bobcat is the cathode plant in Austin. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we're losing viewers, and I'm tired. Will the Tesla Vision cars be safer than cars with radar? Yes. Um, will the Cybertruck air compressor be continuous duty capable for work sites? I believe so, but I'm not 100% sure. So I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, please support this channel on Patreon. I can't believe I left that up this whole time. Patreon supporters get early access to some videos, bonus content, get to submit questions for the Sunday live stream. Check out the t-shirts, Elon Fan Club, Elon Stainless Water Bottle. Links to all that in the description below. Um, thanks to Jim Whitehead, Mark Potochnik, D Digital Blade CA, uh, all the, the moderators. Uh, Jim Whitehead, thank you all for helping out. Um, everybody have a good night.